Oh man. Hey everyone. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of BIM After Dark Live. My name is Jeff, also known as the Rabbit Kid. Today is episode 50, which is pretty wild uh, when you think about it. Uh, for those of you who have never been here before, this is a weekly uh, start as a happy hour, turned into a live sort of session slash education slash conversation uh, stream and um, uh, started it basically when we hit quarantine last year. Here we are a year later, still doing it, but also still in quarantine, which is unfortunate. So trying to figure out how we're going to celebrate um, 50 episodes. And so I thought it'd be pretty neat to invite a bunch of guests back. And so um, I will introduce the guests soon. We've got six guests and we're going to be Ask Me Anything style. So you guys that are here live, you get first dibs at um, a bunch of Revit BIM famous, as uh, Paul Aubin would call us, uh, people that you guys are probably familiar with um, just via Twitter, emails, uh, forums, you name it. Um, before we jump in, as usual, I do have to mention and thank our sponsor for tonight, uh, which is BIM Box. Um, as you guys may be able to tell, the background's different. This is my third office location in uh, uh, three weeks. Um, I'm in the process of reconfiguring rooms and painting and doing finishing the addition and all this cool stuff. So now I'm currently in my master bedroom. And so actually the picture behind me is actually our wedding photo sitting up there. So kind of a weird background. No more guitars, no more other things. Kind of strange to be in my bedroom, but here we are today. Um, and um, with all that being said, uh, the BIM box is currently um, in, in another box um, getting ready to be set up in the new office. So hopefully sooner rather than later, you'll actually see it in the background. But um, BIM box uh, makes computers for uh, the AC industry, more specifically for Revit. So laptops and desktops, and these things are optimized and designed for Revit. Um, I've got the laptop, I've also got a desktop, and I could tell you from experience that they crank. If you've been watching this uh, show for the past three or four months, you'll know all about um, how I've been using them. Um, some great things to know about BIMBOX is they would deliver in 10 to 14 days. Um, they have a three year warranty with all of their units, which is pretty awesome. And I will tell you that their customer support is pretty, pretty rad. Uh, Buck Davis and, and his crew are, are awesome. And so if you're interested and you're looking for a new uh, laptop or desktop, I know the first question I always get over the last 10, uh, 12 years now of doing this blog is, um, you know, what is a good Revit computer? And so now I can tell you BIMBOX. Um, if you're interested, head on over to bimbox.bimafterdark.com or email sales at bimboxusa and let them know that you heard it here and those guys will hook you up. So thank you, BIMBOX, again. And uh, without further ado, we got a whole bunch of people on the line, which is awesome. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you guys all to, once I remember how to unspotlight myself, there we go. <laughs> I'm going to introduce you all to, oh, this Paul Aubin. Hey, Paul. <laughs> to the crew. Oh man, welcome everybody. What's up? We got Phil Philip Chan, Asan. Asan was uh, on episode, I don't remember what number, but talking about Pi Revit. We got Paul Aubin, Nicholas from Revit Pure, Dana from Bim Thoughts, and the infamous Aaron Mahler, who just made it in time. <laughs> welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me, guys. So so this is gonna be yeah, cheers. Uh, you got, you got, <laughs> cheers, cheers, everyone. Oh, he's got the RTC. Philip's got the RTC mug. Oh man, I remember that one. It's built. Sorry, built, but, but I, I believe that was that was that handed out at RTC for built. I don't remember. I, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, Dina Noche. Oh, RTC. This is an old one. Which year was that? 2015. There we go. <laughs> mm. Wait, where was 2015 rtc which one was that oh yes 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 in the heart of chicago right <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> ah they yes oh my goodness they were sorry guys that's all right it was a bunch of banter that's don't awkward. <laughs> <laughs> they heard me though so it's probably even more awkward because yeah. it's just me laughing <laughs> at little things that you guys were all saying yeah. <laughs> sorry guys i had i had desktop <laughs> audio all of that yeah, yeah we have, have to go to backwards yeah. is, it, is it better now <laughs> oh, littering, and, littering and littering and littering and 
<laughs> got it, guys. Got it. There's a six second that. delay. All right. All right. Audio issues. Yeah. Right? Drink to drink to live shows. Fifty episodes later, <laughs> still getting the audio wrong. Well, you'd think after a year we knew how to do a Zoom meeting. You think after a year I'd hire hire like a producer or something to do that part for me, right? <laughs> it's almost like trying to show up to a Zoom meeting on time. <laughs> hey, Boom. in my defense, the Boom. email did not come through. I still don't have it. Oh, that old thing. Oh my boy. Well, blame that to technical glitches. <laughs> That would have worked like a month into a pandemic, Aaron, but I don't know about a year into a pandemic. <laughs> oh, Fair. man. All right. So so everyone live, um, um, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to be checking out the chat. And as I mentioned, the, the goal here is ask us anything. You've got uh, a wide variety of, of Revit specialists with varying backgrounds and expertise. And opening so, Revit opening yes, most of us are currently <laughs> opening of us Revit. Had Revit we, opened, we couldn't we had, get in the meeting. Well, that but was we had because Revit yeah, you, you know we're yeah, in the yeah. wrong application. You had Revit <laughs> open. We wow. had uh, yeah. Aaron was in uh, Jitsi Teams and Outlook and couldn't figure out how to get on Zoom. <laughs> but he's got Revit open, and none of us none of us do, so that's okay. <laughs> oh man. So um, now we're so, running out of drinks. I'm just now saying. we're running out of drinks. He's already down. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so, so everyone, you know, what's on your mind? What's everyone struggling with Revit? Uh, we got, uh, like I said, we've got a wide variety of specialists uh, from, from all over the spectrum. So I'm anticipating we could probably answer. I, I would, I would argue that we could probably answer any question someone asked us between the <laughs> seven of us. I, I would, I would, I would put that out there and Going actually the let's, let's, let's throw it down. Let's throw it down. Right. So. Let's I'm sure, I'm sure like somebody like, like Jacob small or somebody will be out there and like thinking of what is the absolute hardest question I can ask these what guys. I know they won't get today. <laughs> Jacob and I, Jacob and I actually had a lot of fun collabing on that, uh, a goofy little thing a few nights ago. Uh, it was, it was just all good times. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's a lot of fun on Twitter. So Jacob, if you're here, I know you're usually here live or at least on the on the on the replay. So cheers, man. Uh, I'm just checking. There's a bunch of chat. I wanted to make sure there's no questions. Somebody just uh, Galam Galam just asked about linear light fixtures, and he said, "What's up with that?" I'm not really sure what the question is, <laughs> but what's up with that? Um, and maybe he's talking about the default linear light fixture, dude. D uh, clarify that a little bit, buddy, uh, so, so we can at least dig into it. Uh, that, that template, maybe? Yeah, is that what we're talking about? Maybe. Someone asks, "What is the first oh, version of Revit you used?" That's ooh, a good one. Ooh, maybe that we should go question. around. Let's let's go around and see. Right. So so we'll start. I'm gonna go in the order that I see, which may not be the order you guys see. And so we'll start with Asan. What what's the first version oh, wow. of Revit? I'm probably the worst one. I the first one that I used was 2014. Oh man! <clears throat> Actually, right. I started using. It you never even got to experience before the ribbon. No, no, no. no. <laughs> ribbon. Well, the... I kind of like it because it was part of the reason uh, I came from a. When I moved to the US, I started working for a small company and I was just using AutoCAD and I had like, I'd like everybody else, my own scripts and, you know, uh, ways of doing things. Hmm. And then when I moved to uh, the different company, I started using Revit. I was like, oh my God, this is just, there's so much. I need some automation happening on this software. Nice. Uh, and that was the really drive behind like trying to get Python into that thing. Awesome. 2014. 2014. All right. So I'll go now. Uh, mine was 8.1. Um, which I think was the last year before they started using years, right? It was 8.1, then uh, it went to 2008 9 or 9.1. Okay. It was so what 9, year was that? 9.1 9, 9. and then 2008. 2008, yeah. 2007, something like that? Yeah, yeah. I, I might have, I think I started learning it in 2008, but we were we had 8.1 on whatever machine I was in school or something. I don't remember what the heck it was. But yeah, so 8.1 in 2008. Nice. Uh, Phil, Philip, you're next. First, uh, first my, my my first Revit Rush is twenty. Um, sorry, two thousand eight. Yeah, two thousand eight, which was like the first version of using the year mm -hmm. for the definition. Yeah, uh, that was yeah, that's good good times. Yeah, I mean <laughs> three gig three gig switch was what I remember. Oh yes, man, uh, the, the switches! Switch. Oh, crap. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. I remember being on a project where I mean we were forced to split it Carl into like twelve it. models because we mm -hmm. couldn't, you know, we didn't have enough RAM. What a nightmare, man! <laughs> Carl yeah, says it, Revit BR before the ribbon. Oh, is that? <laughs> <laughs> That's really good, Carl. Yep. I like that. Oh, man, uh, Paul, you're next, dude. Hey, same as you, Jeff. Eight point one. Look at that, yeah. man! It was yeah. a popular year. Yeah, apparently. Uh, Nick, your turn. I think it was 2012 because it was just after I graduated in 2011. So I just started after I that. I remember trying it once in college. Maybe mm. I don't remember what version it was, but it seemed like it. 
completely alien program to me. It's just after I started <laughs> oh, doing man. real project that I understood. Teach, it. Teaching architectural college students Revit who've never used it before is yeah. is quite an experience. I can tell you yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Dana, what about you? So I took an internship with AECOM my junior year of college at Virginia Tech. And th so that was 2008 and they taught me Revit. So it looks like all of us are around the wow, same time. Wow, that's pretty funny. Oddly, right? And, and Aaron, 2008 or no, earlier? So nope, same <laughs> as you guys. Uh, so the, the first time I used Revit in production, it was literally January 3rd, 06. That was version 8.1, .1, same 8 .1. as you guys. Yeah. Um, I will say, ironically, I actually have Revit 1 opened right now. Get out of here. You know, I think, oh, you I, think your I think you should share it because I think there's a lot of people who would find that super oh, fascinating, who have never been able to see that before. So I, so I have to give credit to this, uh, to Harry Madison, who posted the installer on Twitter not too long ago. <laughs> Uh, it's an, so, it's an yeah. emulator, right? It has, or through a virtual no, machine? It's, no, no, it's legit. So I'm running it on a virtual machine because I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna endanger my normal machine with this. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so for those of you who weren't around pre 2009, so calendar year 2009 was version 2010, which is when Revit got the ribbon. Oh yeah. Before that, mm. before that, we had the vertical ribbon. Uh, which was a series of ribbons that you know flipped up and down the side. I will tell you, Revit One. Uh, if I go to a 3D view and even try to orbit, it'll probably kick me out. Really? I must have blocked this. Oh, oh there like, it goes. I don't even remember this. It's super unstable, at least, you know, because it's not meant to be on Windows 10, of course. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, now keep in mind, 8.1 was way more advanced than this. Um, right. But yeah, so here's some funny little trivia bits for those of you watching who weren't around back then. There was no constantly present properties palette. Just like type properties, you had to click to get into the properties mm. palette and then yeah. click to get into edit type. And mm. my soul is dying right now while I do this, but yeah, that was, uh, it's crazy how the properties panel, the edit properties panel look exactly like what you open still. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. crazy. It's crazy how much hasn't changed. Yeah, yeah. exactly. There, there is a lot. Oh, wow. <laughs> there, there is, there is a lot that has not changed, yeah. um, but I will, so, you know, and I won't, I won't hog the screen share, but I'll tell you something funny. So my first model going back to, I don't remember if it was Paul or Philip who just said it, but my first Revit project was two and a half million square feet. It was six phases of renovation. No computer that we had could handle mm -hmm. it. I still have the models and I upgraded them to 21 this year. And can I just say my first model was such a piece of trash. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, there's nothing better than looking back at old Whoever models. built that crap needs to be fired. I'm just yeah. saying. Well, my first my first model was probably 15 place families that I made it myself for nice. a project. So that's, that's my first experience. I, I was learning Revit 8.1 at the same time as I was writing a book on it. Ooh. So I was literally that professor that was one chapter ahead of the students. Yeah, but it's the best way to learn when you have to teach. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah look what I learned this week, guys. <laughs> Let me <Right>. teach you. <laughs> oh, that's fascinating. Well, so that's actually what happened with me is I, I got back to Virginia Tech after my internship and the program chair was like, oh my gosh, you know Revit, teach it. And I was like, I guess I know Revit. <laughs> I could sure show some people. And of course, I became like the girl in the studio everybody asked questions to. So. Yeah, when you get questions, you're like, let me get back to you next week. Yep. We, we <laughs> actually. Your ceiling isn't showing. We'll figure that out. I don't feel that old, but we weren't allowed to have computers in the studio when I was in school. Hmm. Oh, I remember I, that. Yep. I mean, that, I, I can see that. A, Oh, oh, we're doing the age thing. I think I got you all. <laughs> well, I mean, Paul was around. I, I didn't. I didn't. Family, I didn't so ask. Of course, he wins that, that or, argument. Is that what but... we're doing now? <laughs> There were three computers in the entire architectural studio when I went to school. Okay. There was a little <laughs> tiny room, three Mac pluses. Do you guys remember these you things? Sure it was a tiny Paul, room. when you were in school, Moses was still carving okay. stone. He, he was. He, was. He, he actually did a, yeah. a seminar at my school one day. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> stone man. carving. So yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to read some comments here, though, that we do that. I, I was also in the background scrolling down because some of the some of the first, if, if anyone feels like trying to find them, some of the first tutorials that I did on the blog were with the old ribbon, and I still have them live. I think they're on screencast, and I keep paying every year for it because I think maybe someone would go to them, but I don't know if they're still going to them <laughs> but because they're probably pretty useless <laughs> since they're in the old since the old version, but there's stuff there. All right, I saw a couple questions. Screencast, I'm trying to... is, is that the predecessor to YouTube? So, so before you know, this blog was actually created before YouTube was 
you know, the Revit Kid was created really? before YouTube was. Wow. It was a thing, but it wasn't a thing yet, right? So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I hosted big, the huh? first like I don't even know how many videos were hosted. It was a video hosting, kind of like Vistia or Wistia or whatever. And but you have to pay yearly for it, and like all the archive stuff. If I had stopped hosting it, all those videos would be gone, and that's like you know a hundred something posts. I don't hey, know how now. <laughs> Oh, now people are making fun of Paul. Listen, this is Twitter. Yeah, this is like, YouTube, uh, dude. You you, you, you got to have thick skin to be on YouTube. <laughs> I know, man. Like, hey. Right, Form so, Z in college reference. Loving so, it. So hopefully. Yeah, hopefully, Form Z too here. <laughs> I'm trying to. I know there's a ton of questions coming in, guys, live. So I'm going to try and get through them. Um, and I see a couple good ones. So I'm just going to filter through and try, trying to get to the, to the other ones there. Um, generative design. I guess we could. What is the point? Um, maybe maybe we could talk about that for a split second because that is a good question. So Jay Heft asked, sort of the generative generative design tool in Revit, and sort of what's the point of having it? And oh, wait a second. Oh, it's not, it's not it's not accessible in the student edition. Get out of here. Never mind. He's just complaining. Okay, it's not it's not accessible in the student. <laughs> that is that is bizarre. So generative design isn't accessible in the student edition. Yeah, and maybe, the, maybe, so, maybe yeah, it's, so, it's not available then. Because it's a subscription so let me, type let me, thing. They would, let me, would be the ones who would need it. Let me right? throw one thing out Or actually use it, right? Show them how to use even it. though, you know, even though we don't really want to, you know, totally be covering for Autodesk in their defense, some interesting stuff happened when they transitioned, you know, to right. like the more kind of subscription-based named accounts. I was actually Desiree Mackey's lab assistant at AU one year, hmm. and she was teaching a lab on structural features that were only there in the point release, which you only got on subscription. Now, the funny thing about it is their lab computers had special serial numbers to mm -hmm. install, which meant they weren't technically on subscription and the features weren't there. So... All that to say, like, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to reach out to somebody at Autodesk, no promises, of course, but a lot of them generally overlook things like, yeah, we give software to students, but they don't get the subscription benefits. Yeah, so, or, yeah, or they don't always... have access to them and like the, the admin does and he doesn't know how right. to give it to exactly. everyone. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. That, that so I'll at least ask goes, somebody about it. That also moves on to partners. You know, mm -hmm. so you've got these partners out there that are expected to support the software and they don't have access to some of the features based on the license they get. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know exactly. I, I don't know what school he or she goes to, but I, I would argue, I would I would bet that somebody, whoever sets up the license, it's probably a subscription and they may have the ability to to ask, give access to something like that if it's, an, if it's a license where, you know, the hey, admin I, I has the rights or something. I think I got the answer to but, the uh, yeah. linear light thing if you want to. Oh, okay, go, go for it, yeah. All right, I'll just, so uh, this is going. I don't remember who asked that. So we're going back. Something about linear this. light fixtures. What's wrong? What's the deal? I mean, it's literally <laughs> this. The linear template starts with a linear light source, mm -hmm. and the other light fixture starts with, you know, a non-linear <laughs> light source, a point source. I, I literally, that's the only difference. That's the only difference. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know I was why we're actually we need expecting two that to be a line-based component. That's pretty funny. Yeah, it's not line-based. It's just the the properties of the you know the light source so we'll just file that under junk <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right so th there's a question here that uh, i think could be kind of cool and then we'll get into there's a couple nitty-gritty ones i saw so the first one is kind of interesting and um i think it's it's from dm branch so dm branch thanks for joining us um what is the one feature that you wished was in revit that never seems to get in the yearly updates so i'm assuming this is a wish list type of ask so I'd be curious, uh, I mean, if anyone has burning desire, or if we want to go in order, but maybe just anyone who's ready to jump in, we don't have to all answer it. Is there is there a wish list item that you're like waiting every year to see it and it's never there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I'm going to jump in just because go DM Branch is actually uh, a client of ours. So hey, oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, so this is actually really funny. Uh, back in like 8.1 or 9, there was a grayed out option in one of the menus in Revit that was called Track Changes. And it was there as like some kind of a glitch or an accident, but I was really excited because I thought Revit was going to get a feature like Microsoft Word's track changes. And the premise behind it would be like, you clicked a button that said, I'm issuing 100% today, and it would start to track everything you had edited so that you could then automate revisions and things of that nature. And keep in mind, this was like 06, 07. And then the next year or when the next release came out, I mean, the option that was grayed out disappeared. 
And then nothing ever came of it again. And every time I ask Autodesk about it and just kind of like prod them, like, hey, this thing used to be visible, like what happened to it? And they're like, well, you know, just because software thinks an element changed doesn't mean the element really changed. And I'm like, I freaking hate that answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, that's why it's, you know, it's called a shortcut because it's difficult. Otherwise mm. it would just be called the way. So <laughs> go figure it out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, that's a great one. Yeah. Uh, follow up. Uh, Dave Plum says linear lights don't rotate with the space bar until after you place them. So another little subtle. <laughs> okay. So there oh, you those... go. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. All right. So that's annoying. Yeah. I guess. I, I, I guess I've never done that, so I never ran into yeah. that. But I mean, okay. I've only ever used the light fixture template and just changed the style. <laughs> when I, knew I was going to say, like, there's 362 people watching who have used the linear light fixture. I didn't even know that thing was there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I start with face-based template, so like you know, and then switch to the light fixture mm. pretty much right from the start. So it's like the, I I hardly use that myself as well. Is that ceiling based? The default linear light template? Is that is that why? Is that is that ceiling based? I don't even know. Uh, I, don't I, I don't think it's ceiling based. Huh? Um, huh. Anyway, uh, Sean, um, I can't answer your question. All I can say is, stay tuned. Oh man. <laughs> that's a conversation with just sean <laughs> you'll never no, know if you look in the <laughs> chat you'll see what i mean uh, you know got it, got I, it. I, I get it i get that far i know what you mean yeah, yeah. Can't, can't say any more than that uh no it is not ceiling based jeff it's oh just, okay uh, hmm. yeah just yeah I'm, I'm behind on the chat so i'll catch up <laughs> i'll look at it later um uh, one feature i will say that and i don't know if this is a feature in general but you know lately i've been doing a ton with with schedules and data and i do wish that there was more flexibility in formula formulas and schedules. Like, mm. like why, why, why can't we like have, I don't want to say DAX, but like, why can't we have like better formulas? Like why can't we calculate an area or a total in a formula of a column? Like, like, that, why? That other program like why? Out there, like Excel? Yeah. Like, like, like why? Yeah. Like why? Yeah. Like string equals string or just, just general data stuff. Like, like why do I have to dump it out to calculate a total to bring it back in? Like it's there, you're doing it. It's on the bottom of my footer. Like, <laughs> come on. so that that's so, been frustrating lately. A lot of schedule stuff. Yeah, I, I agree with it. With the schedules, I was trying to use if statements with uh, string values, but it doesn't mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. uh, for a condition. You you need an integer, mm -hmm. so you have to convert your string to an integer, which is a waste of time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess it's parameters. probably not that complicated to add, right? And you can compare them uh, in Dynamo. Yeah, you can. I guess so. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but then you got to keep actually... running the Dynamo script. Mm -hmm, it doesn't mm -hmm. just run. Make it, make it playerable. Yeah. yeah. And the the so, other, I, I I guess I'll jump back in the past, uh, and it I want to do a shout out to uh, Sam for PyRivet because I used to program uh, <laughs> patterns by using text files. Oh and yes. I, I, every time I did it, I had to relearn it all over again. So how does it work again? Mm, mm. And I just spent hours just typing these dumb text files. Yeah. And patterns. When patterns I discovered sure. Pyrus, it was yeah. like, oh my god! All right, like, that's, so that's bravery for you. For you. So, so shout maker. out. I mean, yeah, is, yeah, uh, we're, we're gonna raise a glass for the pattern maker for sure. Yeah, yeah. For sure, yeah, we'll raise a glass. Back, <laughs> yes. If you guys don't know what we're talking about, I mean, as a sound, you realize maybe you've saved more than. 10,000 hours of mundane <laughs> boring work with your well, tool. Yeah, I mean, I literally cut out two hours of training classes and I just said, here's what you used to do to make patterns. Now go to Patreon, this site, and then download freaking PyRevit. And I don't want to teach this part of the class anymore. <laughs> yeah. Wait, but wait, but did you, I bet you, some one of you must use Hatch 22 before PyRevit, right? You've got to use Hatch 22. Yeah, Hatch 22 yeah. and HatchKit yeah. before Hatch 22. And let's see it like nine different ways people can make smash disaster <laughs> to draw hatch patterns. And then Hassan rocks up and he's like, let's just draw it in Revit and hit a button. Okay. <laughs> Duh, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah, awesome. I, really hated I would have done that if I knew how. <laughs> yeah, but the, the thing is, is when it's free, like what uh, Asan does, you don't have to convince your, your boss to buy the plugin. Because exactly. else you're like, hey, can, can we buy this plugin? That's your problem. Not really. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. was my problem. We had the, business, uh, the company had a hash twenty two account. Yeah, uh, license, mm. and he would use, and he was the only person that was able to make patterns. And I was like, this is not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> exactly. Not exactly. Exactly. Uh, anyone interested, if you have no idea what we're talking about, I did post a link to Asan's episode when he was on here, which was episode 35. And uh, he went through PyRevit and showed and showed it. So check that out in the link below. Uh, there was a good question that um, I think is one that uh, will be fascinating for us all to, to talk about. But also, um, from my experience, it's something that is probably one of the least uh, known 
parts of Revit or, or at least understood by, by people when I'm teaching them is it, um, the main difference between design options and phasing. So I would say, I'm trying to rephrase it a little bit and say, you know, when when would you guys use design options versus phasing? Because, uh, you know, obviously I think there's opinions on, on how you can approach both and I'm sure everyone has an opinion on it. So maybe we just either, Paul raised his hand, so we'll let Paul go first and, and then we'll kind of jump. I'm sure everyone has an opinion, but I do know that this is hot. It's, it's easy. Phasing is time. Design options is a fork in the road. Period. That's well, isn't it. time a fork in the road? <laughs> Uh, they they're not mutually exclusive uh, right. Not mutually, right you can you can have phases in your design options and you can put design options in your phases i mean it, they're, they're two the only thing these two tools have in common is that they both uh, control what you see in your in your views at any given time based on what you know the settings you choose so you're either going to see a certain design option or you're going to see a certain phase but other than that they're really completely different and are designed to solve two totally different problems Mm -hmm. And, I, and yeah, there's I, another I, really exciting thing that might be coming soon in that arena, but uh, y'all just have to wait a few more weeks. <laughs> Jeff, you're going to have to have a, uh, uh, a what's new in 22 uh, session. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. For sure, for sure. <laughs> Let's not break any NDAs today. <laughs> no. I, mean, I mean, the other thing I would, you know, the other thing I would throw out there about both of those is I 100% agree with what Paul said. And, you know, if you go to the depths of, you know, the internet and on Revit forums and whatever else, you'll read all this weird stuff about people like using work sets for phasing and using mm. design <clears throat> options for phasing <throat> and phases for design <laughs> options. And the reality is, as Paul said, a lot of this has to do with whether or not things exist in the model. And like, if you try to use design options as phases or phases as design options, it's going to trash stuff because the, I, the objects are still there they're just not visible. And that's very different than the objects not existing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I will, I will throw a wrench in the gear and say, um, the, the one time that we and I use, um, design options for phasing is for site logistics planning. Um, and that is, there may be like 13 site shifts Yeah. And anyone who's ever dealt with topography and phasing knows yeah. why I do that. <laughs> and really, it's because topography and phasing just don't go together very well. Unless well, you, unless and you, everything in Revit doesn't <laughs> every, work well. Everything. Topography yeah, yeah, yeah. just right, sucks. Right. There's, an asterisk, there's an asterisk that's needed at the end of this yes, thing. It, yes. you know, phasing is a very narrow, they're both actually a very mm -hmm. narrow focused scope, right? Like they had one problem in mind that they were mm -hmm. trying to solve. And the minute you get something a little bit more complicated than that, that's when things start to get a little ratty. And uh, multi-phase projects, you you worked for construction, so I'm not at all surprised to hear that you had to come up with some some clever workarounds because you what you think of as phasing and what a typical <coughs> architect thinks of as phasing right. is, you know, there's like an order of magnitude separating mm -hmm. the two there. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Does, mm -hmm. yeah. does that does it annoy you any of you here where Rome cannot be just swap out with faces like once yeah, you put it there? <laughs> yes. And, but you, the worst you can't, you can't is, demolish uh, the, the room, plans. you mean? Yeah. Oh, in, yeah. In defense, in defense, here's the idea that because the room is auto generated, right? The the room is the space. It's not a thing that you touch. So when you change the bounding elements, the room is supposed to automatically react. But the part of that, so that's the concept and you can almost buy into it. But the part of that where it falls apart is they didn't stop to think about what a major PIA it is to have to deal with all the rooms that didn't change because now you got to duplicate them all into the next phase, which is, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is so, there yeah. any good way to show the room tag when you're quitting a demolition plan from... Because obviously from you existing? want to show the, the, the previous phase, right? Yeah, yeah, that fabulously revised text tool from 2018. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the way the way the way I used to do it, I think there's a post way back when that I, I showed is is we used to keep a, an existing room plan and you do the overlap on the sheet. So yeah, we have, just the yeah. text. Yeah, that that's the one I know. Which but you know, I've it's, it's semi smart because it at least way. updates, yeah. right? But it's still mm -hmm. you're overlapping two things, and it's you know it's unfortunate. But that is probably when I'm teaching people phasing. That is probably one of the hardest things to, well, I just say it's one. There's a lot of hard things when it comes to teaching people phasing for whatever reason. But um, yeah, the fact that rooms, they exist on one phase, but they don't get demolished. And so people are like, I don't understand. They don't get demolished and they just exist on the phase. That's all you got to know. They exist on this phase and that's it. <laughs> Irby no. Irwin on the chat says, I have a way uh, to show demo room tags. So yeah, I would be curious yeah. to show that. Oh, all right. Reach out to Pervy there. <laughs> 
Oh man. So uh, <laughs> there seems to be a lot of structural questions out I there. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Was there any ones that 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 spiked your interest, Paul, or or just in general? <laughs> I'm not structural. That's, that's <laughs> is that the one? Is that the one area that we're uh, that we're yeah. uh, we're lacking in, or no? I don't know. It depends on what yeah. the question is, I guess. Um, I'm trying to see. There's a whole bunch of them. I saw one with rebar, and I will be the first to admit that I've only dabbled in rebar modeling in Revit. So I don't know. Does any has anyone here experienced rebar models in Revit? No, maybe not. <laughs> a little bit. I mean, a little bit. Not enough. The, the The question in the chat was about the differences in rebar this year versus the, oh, you know, okay. rebar, rebar in other years. I mean, we deal a fair amount between the design teams we work with and the contractors we work with. And I mean, the way rebar is contracted in the U S is different than overseas. So mm -hmm. I, I generally tell everybody involved to just avoid rebar in the U S because it's, it's not like, you know, a lot of the countries in Europe where the structural engineers are actually responsible for that. Yeah. So yeah. There's just not a lot of value add here for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, honestly, most, most of the work that, that I've dealt with has been in Tecla uh, rebar stuff mm. and they apparently, everyone who uses it says it's the best rebar modeling program out there. I've never done it before, but, um, but I also like to try and force our subcontractors to use Revit because it makes all of our lives easier down the road. Oh, Tecla's <laughs> amazing though. I love yeah. Tecla models. Tecla steel. Yep. So, so yeah, apparently we're telling, uh, the answer to that question is don't use Revit for rebar, use Tecla. <laughs> Oops, sorry. <laughs> Somebody in the chat says, score DX says, I create a family with em embedded generic annotation for room talking about showing room tags. Hmm. So that's interesting. I would be curious hmm. to see how that Scout works. I guess you have kind of an invisible object. Scour I, I DX in the chat also legitimately created Elsa in Revit. If you haven't seen this, you need to go to <laughs> the Revit yes. forum. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yep. Everyone's got to check out the Revit form. If someone finds that post, link it in the chat. Um, but actually, the, now that you've mentioned it, so one of the things what, we- Wait, Elsa from the Frozen? Yep. Oh, the okay. Elsa. <laughs> the, well, what other a, Elsa? A, Come on. There's, there's a whole There's a whole thread on I, I have daughters, families. I should know, right? There's a whole the, thread uh, on crazy families, and he owns it. Uh, one, one thing I didn't think of Sorry. that uh, that could work is, so we, we do, um, and I do, I have a post on this too, I believe, we do a lot of 3D, 3D room text. So we have a Dynamo script that, you know, places model text in 3D rooms or model text in 3D that we use for coordination, especially in like Navisworks. And that technically, it's not updated to the room. You'd have to refresh it, but that can be demoed and phased, mm -hmm. right? I believe. So, so Purdy's so solution be is to create a secondary view hmm. where only rooms are visible. She mm -hmm. creates a view template and applies mm -hmm. this and has the tags applied mm -hmm. to those rooms and then overlays that on the sheet. Yeah, yeah, because so then, because then the one, views, yeah, two views, different on. phases, right? So it'd be, you got it. It'd be new construction show previous and demo, and then the room, the room view is just existing, complete or just existing, whatever. whatever. And you got it, Pervy. Wear that mm. badge of honor. Yeah, wear it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have to phase control. Uh, I just missed a whole bunch of questions. Hopefully, you guys saw one in there. Man, I can't believe how much chat action is happening right now. <laughs> this is yeah, they're having a party is, right there. I know, that. I know. I mean, usually I'm able to <laughs> usually I'm able to keep up while we're all talking, but man, there's a lot going on here, which is pretty sweet. I knew demo and phasing, or uh, sorry, phasing and 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 design options would be would be interesting. I, I will well, say yeah. the one thing with design options, and this is now speaking from the construction side of things. Um, Pay attention to those when you hand off models and just know that contractors are going to accept primary. Sorry. <laughs> like if there's 30 options in there, I'm not calling to figure out because God only knows what's going to happen. I'm going to, and I tell them every time I say, if you're, if you're going to leave options in there, make sure primary is what you want because I'm accepting primary because I'm not dealing with that crap after the fact. <laughs> so one thing with design options, if you guys use them, they're great. I use them all the time, but just know that downstream use um, most likely your primary is going to be the one that gets used because whether the person's doing it accepting or whether it's being exported, it's, it's primary is usually be the one that goes out there. Well, and also if it's a contractor that's only linking in the models, unless they You're aggressively yeah. go into yep. VG RVT link custom, they will only see primary. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> oh, here's a good question. Speaking of demo and phasing from Brandon. What's up, Brandon? And I think this goes along. Uh, Nick, I think you had um, your live stream yesterday was about yeah. phasing, right? And I think this is probably right along there. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Ceiling, and I talked about plans. RCP. Yeah. Because, yeah, and that's something else that Assam actually helped me because I've created for ceiling, you cannot show dash line, right? For demolitions, because it, it's a pattern that show the grid lines of the ceiling. So you right. can create a custom pattern for the ceiling that show with uh, the dash lines. Mm -hmm. Although the issue with that is you have to create a different type. So the pattern shows properly, a demo but, type. but still at least if you really want the graphics of the dash line for the ceiling, it works. You need to create a different pattern. 
mm. for it to work properly. And since 2019, uh, for existing ceiling, well, you can have uh, two patterns at once instead of having uh, giant overrides where everything becomes great. <laughs> Or, or we can, we can move on from old drafting standard and start printing in color. Maybe we use red or maybe, you know, yeah. maybe we just move on from the, the bullshit drafting standards that we've lived with. Yeah. Try not yeah. To do that. That's, Cause that's, thing, that's, yeah. that's, that's where I go with demo. And I, I, I argued all day long with, with some of the principles for that. It's like, we're mm -hmm. sitting here spending, you know, two days trying to get a stupid, uh, acoustic tile ceiling to look dashed. When like the, we could just yeah, that's th a good point. throw the your 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 standards that were written you know handwritten in the in the eighties. Can you say fire tape? Uh, <laughs> another the, one. Yep, fire tape. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I guess we're using the new tools to do with the yeah, old yeah, things. Yeah. But <laughs> either either if you're gonna print print in color or or let's not mm. print at all, right? And send send the PDF and then you've got all the yeah. color you yeah. need, right? <laughs> but no, that's a great. So if uh, maybe we'll post a link to that. I mean, we don't necessarily have to jump into that because I think you did a pretty good job explaining it yesterday, Nick. But uh, on Nick's mm. live stream. Um, yesterday, I believe you walked through using PyRevit to generate the hatch pattern for yep. the dotted, the dashed acoustic ceilings. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, I remember that tearing people to pieces back when we were trying to convert to Revit back in like 2012 or 11. Just like, but we can't make dash ceiling plans. It was like that and, Asan, and solid I think dots Asan in should an tell us, uh Should tell us the top three tools that are in PyRevit that I have no idea are there. Go, <laughs> go. Top three PyRevit tools. Oh, that's me. Put that's me you. That's you. <laughs> um, so the, I guess the most popular ones that I get the most questions on, and or like you know, good feedback on, the pattern tool is very popular. The print tool is very popular because you can print, you can print using the Revit's print mechanism, but doing the things that it's really hard to do, like printing sheets in order, <laughs> separately or combined. Mm. Mm. Um, so you can do it. It does like hacky stuff to get it to get it to print correctly in the PDF. That's very popular. The Keynote Manager is becoming popular because it's backwards compatible mm. with the Revit's text files and stuff, and it actually works with Beam, Beam 360 now. Um, That's the, nice. Yeah, and then what else? What else is good? A lot of people like uh, like the uh, like the pick tools, the selections, mm. and all that kind of stuff. Also, the who did that button is one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, although uh, uh, I was teaching that for uh, to a student in, in college, uh, that the who did that tool, and he told me actually you can do it with the existing work sharing uh, features, and I didn't believe yeah, yeah, it at you can first. Just hover but over it's something. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually it. It, it uses the Revit's API to get that mm -hmm. information. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's yeah. already. Yeah, it's just it's pretty hidden. You ha really have to know uh, how to do it with, with the who did that. It's a little easier. Uh, uh, personally, I also love set the rev revisions on sheet. Mm. I know there was other plugins that or with Dynamo, it's not that mm. complicated, but still just having a button to do it quickly, uh, super helpful. And do, does the sheets I'm, do uh, CAD too? I don't remember. Can you do CAD and sheets at the same time or no? That's a different tool. CAD exports. Uh, I'm asking oh, this in, the, in the print tools? In oh, his print okay. tools, yeah, sorry, no, no, sorry. Print tool is printing to PDF it's only. just PDF, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's just okay. for printing steps. That's one, oh, of, so that's one of those things where I always point, I forgot what tool it is, but because we, you know, a big struggle again is 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 getting PDFs, DWGs, and a model on every submission from a design team. For whatever yeah. reason, it's just like a challenge. And <laughs> and so, so I always try to point them to tools and like, actually, you can do it in the same amount of time if you just use a tool that does it all at the same time for yeah you. Like, i mean so we use yeah we use the ctc batch that's what that. it is and, CTC, and my yep, only yep. affinity for that one particular one is that you get to save the settings file because even if you give a team that does batch to a bunch of architects and engineers unfortunately if person one does it today and person two does it next week they do something different and it's nice to have the settings file actually saved out mm -hmm. but in PyRevit, my favorite when i'm working on complex projects with a lot of irregular geometry is Auto align the section box to a face mm. because mm. it just takes your whole 3D view and rotates the section. It's mm -hmm. freaking amazing. Mm -hmm. Vomitoriums and stadiums love it. <laughs> yeah. With, yeah, exactly. Anything that's angled, it helps a lot designing those kind of stuff. The, in the print tool, I have something that um, you can reserve um, order numbers, index numbers, basically, when you're printing. So if you have like template sheets, reserved sheets in your model for all this stuff that are supposed to come from other engineers and CAD files and stuff like that. Uh, you can mark those as non-printable sheets or like, you know, uh, cre cre create placeholder sheets and stuff for them. And then mm -hmm. when you print, it prints the reserve numbers and reserves the numbers in the prints. So you can just move all those PDFs into one directory and then combine them. Stuff mm -hmm. like this that make a little life a little easier. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, add your Revit icons to as a button in PyRevit? 
Uh, yeah, there's actually, um, I'm going to publish the installer for it, but the one you should get the one from Aaron. Um, Aaron makes one that has like everything in it. Oh, um, the icon. Yeah, but but I, it doesn't actually put them there for you. I just have the icon files. If you have a way to automatically oh, okay. do them for, I do have an awesome. installer for it. Okay, we can we can. Oh, we can then just take the it. icons and go for it if you want. To, I mean, if you want to. Okay. Okay. I do have one that I there's stuff like there's the numbers. Hatch. So we already drank to the hatch tool, but can we just drink to the free tool that Asan gives you? <laughs> and I'm not drinking anymore. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Sorry. Yeah. And uh, shout out to the the wipe tool also. I was just checking oh, yeah. the, the list. Mm -hmm. It is yeah. the only icon that's ready. In my room. <laughs> do not touch this. I was just gonna say that is the best, but also the most dangerous tool in. in yeah, the it, 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 it can be dangerous. <laughs> but I, I guess one of the questions leads me that it, there's a tool called wipe empty elevation tags. So what's going on with elevation tags in Revit? Why are mm -hmm. they? still there when you you hide uh, it's just elevations. the circle right yeah, yeah just the, like the body stays What's going it's on annoying. just the dot yeah yeah it's Super a side effect is, of is it the reason is there a reason? how the families are designed so the families mm. the tag families are nested there's a parent mm. that holds the circle and then a couple of ones that have the sides when you get rid of the sides the parent doesn't know that it doesn't have any children so it stays there mm. <laughs> he doesn't know that lost his kids doesn't have any doesn't children <laughs> bad <laughs> parents <Very sad. laughs> I you know what's interesting yeah. to me about the elevation bodies and the pointers is so many folks just assume that they could still only have four because that's what the original version of Revit had. Like our elevation circle has like eight or 16 around it because there's so many rooms where stuff's just at 45 degrees and mm. it's nice to just be able to plop it in and get that 45 degree elevation and not have to like go rotate an elevation tag or something. Good tip right there. Oh, Everyone only out there. Aaron would have done that. <laughs> That's like so, totally an Aaron thing right there. Why, yeah, but it makes total sense because it's one of those things yeah. that you wouldn't even think about it, but why not, right? So yeah. there's, there's a good tip. It's You, you don't have to have just four four yeah. elevation markers on an elevation. You could have as many like, as you can fit. It sounds an awful right? lot like work to me. <laughs> uh. <laughs> um, I think Pervy had a question directed at you, Dana. Um, I missed it. Hold on. I saw I think it was... Oh God, it was, it what are you excited oh, about that you're working on right now? What are you working on that's exciting you? Ooh. What's exciting me? Um, well, my YouTube channel, Dana Mobim, is exciting me and Ooh. learning Python with Oh, I love that name. Say that again. Dana Mobim. Oh, that's cool. That's my YouTube <laughs> channel. So it's definitely perfect. check that out. It's Please perfect. subscribe. Yes, head on over to subscribe. Could. That would be great. I'm going to be posting my next video tomorrow morning. It's going to be actually a Dynamo short, so a little bit of a variant of the, the Python with, with Asan, even though that will be next week. So we'll have that again. Yeah. Um, but, but within Smith Group, um, luckily Smith Group is multidisciplinary, we're huge. And I've been working a lot with a lot of the other disciplines uh, to incorporate computational workflows, including, and this is crazy, if, especially to, to Pervy and those of you who know me personally in DC, with AutoCAD and Civil 3D. Right, because we can get in mm. there and Dynamo now. And I am so excited with Parallax. And I saw Lauren Schmidt in the in the chat and some of the things they're going to be bringing out. So always loved Landform and that <laughs> that package. So definitely see. But when I saw she was working at Parallax, I was like, oh my gosh, that that's a collab that I can't wait to see <laughs> right there. Um, so She's doing yeah, I'd say that's probably stuff. it. Yeah, getting into those crazy things, right? I mean, out of my own comfort zone for sure, being vulnerable within BIM. <laughs> so, so, so you're working with civil civil 3D users that they're not, are they part of Smith Group or these are consultants? Yep, yep. They're part we're of Smith Group. We're multi mm -hmm. We have we have landscape architects that are in AutoCAD. That's pretty much all, the only users yeah. we have in AutoCAD. Mm -hmm. um, and some civil 3D, you know, uh, civil people mm -hmm. using AutoCAD and civil 3D. So. You know, just really trying to get in there, working with Jacob Small. Thank you so much, Jake. And, um, you know, just trying to understand. I I actually, like I said, I took an internship in college and learned Revit. I've, I've never worked in production in AutoCAD. So mm -hmm. even just trying to understand what the issues are in terms of how I can incorporate computational workflows is a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that and then also working with other disciplines. So like the systems tab in Revit is also a, a crazy mm. challenge for me. And like all the tabs and tabs and dialogues and dialogues within there i mean mm -hmm. that's that's a crazy tab so. I, I will say so when it comes to civil what fascinates me the most is so i, I we spend we spend a lot of time with, with my groups uh, modeling existing utilities um mainly because 
you know, no one wants to do it usually is the case, but also a lot of civil, civil engineers are not using the 3d aspects of their programs. Um, and it fascinates me because it's one of those areas where, where it's really not hugely difficult to do. Uh, you know, when you start getting a feel for how profiles work and topography and stuff like that, even in Revit, we're doing a lot of it in Revit where we're following topography and just using pipes and ducts and all that good stuff. Um, but part of me thinks that part of the reason civil guys don't want to do it is because, um, uh, they don't, they don't necessarily want to know all of that information or want to, want to actually model it. Like they're comfortable saying point A and point B and we're kind of, you know, gray area in between. And I, I think that's part of it is it's almost like, should, should, do, do we actually, because you're making a lot of assumptions on underground, especially existing utilities, but it is so valuable even to make the assumptions is more valuable than, than not. Right. And, and so, so we do it all the time and we're actually, we do, we do most of ours in Revit. Um, and so I've always been interested to, to dive in and see, it's probably a lot easier in civil 3d. It's just, I'm more comfortable in Revit. <laughs> reading a, reading a 2d profile of, you know, of underground conduit and then converting it into 3d in Revit. It's a, it's a workflow I'm used to now. Well, and even just like Googling or watching some of the AU presentations and things like that. And hmm. luckily, you know, we have people in there and doing that and people that are experts in their field. So very grateful for them. Um, but you know, it's like, what's a corridor, and why do they use it like that? Like, why do they call it? You know? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. The, the the civil engineer. Yeah, I mean, that's what. Well, just understanding drawings to start with is one thing, right? And then from there, start you start to put the pieces together. Oh man, I can't believe how much the chat is going nuts. You guys are awesome out there. Um, I think I saw a good question there, but I missed it. I'm trying to scroll back. There's been a bunch, but I, I know it's, it's going so fast. So fast. It's going, I should have had someone moderate, try and moderate, uh, uh, yeah, for you, me you on need, this one. Like I told you, man, you got to get that kid of yours on there. You know? uh, yeah, I know you guys, <laughs> you guys would just keep seeing the, the, the bin box video over and over and over and over and over again. That's what you keep seeing. Cause you just love smashing the buttons. <laughs> uh, let's see. What were your best resources? Oh, here we go. This is a good one. I think, um, a few of you may have some, some good input on and, Daniel Howard, thanks, man, for joining, asks, what were your best resources for learning general coding like C Sharp or Python and what drove you to learn them? I would say the first part is probably really cool to figure out because I think Dynamo and, and that kind of stuff, I think we, we kind of know the resources there. But when it comes to just learning like a C Sharp or something, and I don't know, Asan, maybe because you learned Python, I think, on your own, right? At, at some point oh. you decided maybe what resources would you suggest to folks? Um, for Python, I would highly suggest um, there, there's so many uh, videos and all that kind of stuff, courses online that you can find for from free to like paid and all that kind of stuff. Anyone would do. Python is a very simple language. It's very easy to pick it up. Mm. What I learned Python from is the tutorials on the python.org website itself. Mm. It's pretty nice. It takes you through the language. It takes a little bit more time because you have to read through it, but it, it gives you the foundation that you kind of need to be able to find your way later uh, with Python. Hmm. For C sharp, that's I. This is kind of going to be uh, going to be a little bit uh, complex because I really suggest finding a course, maybe on LinkedIn Learning or something like that, uh, that teaches you C sharp. There we go. Uh, <laughs> teach C sharp because C sharp is you gotta you gotta you gotta get past the first uh, the steep learning curve, especially if you're the first uh, first programmer to be able to be effective uh, later on. Otherwise, it's just going to be a lot of trouble. Yeah, so don't but, don't play with don't try to learn it with like you know um trial and error and all that kind of stuff uh, yeah just, just a quick shout out to uh, uh michael from art smarter he has a few uh, courses mm -hmm. on uh using c sharp with rivet i was just gonna say uh, michael kill kelly's arc .com. Yeah. um Arch he was actually Martin. on in, in in an older episode too i could pull his up but um he does have some and they're nice because he's an architect and i think he mm -hmm. kind of structures it sort of with his mindset which will yeah, help yeah. folks i think it's you know teaching an architect versus teaching a computer science major i think even though yeah, it's huge even huge. though they're all kind of getting mashed together now you know it's still the the learning process i think in the way their brains work or our brains work is a little, a little different so that's definitely a good resource so michael if you see this in the future you know shout out to you buddy michael's actually uh connect he lives about 40 minutes away from me so it's kind of cool <laughs> Small, small world. One of those things. <laughs> we knew each other online for like five years and they were like, wait, you're in Middletown. You're in Newtown. Oh my goodness. You're like right down the road. <laughs> All right. Anyone, anyone else on, as far as coding? I mean, I don't know if any, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a C sharp or, or Python pro or anything like that. So I can't even give any opinion on that. <laughs> 
I would tell I'm you guy, any anything I've ever written has been copy pasted. <laughs> I'm the guy that insists on using uh, uh, string nodes and number nodes instead of code blocks. So don't talk to me about coding. <laughs> but I want the node. I want the node there. <laughs> I wrote two lines in PowerShell the other day. Had a typo in one of them. Deleted half of our door library. Uh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> but you had a backup, right? Oh, well, yes, definitely I definitely had watch, a backup. You should definitely watch the Python you know for rabbit creations that Esan and i are doing because i'm doing it all in dynamo and using dynamo nodes as much as i can and then filling in the gaps with python hmm. and Esan I, I is using to, Revit python scheduled it unfortunately right during what we call affectionately me and my producer the Revit rodeo so this is the time of year when I have to update all of my Revit courses and so I'm like knee deep in recording and I was like I really want to you know watch that but uh yeah if it's all recorded I will definitely check that out so, so you're so you're never you're not always that upset when they don't add a ton of features every year because it's not as much you have to update <laughs> there's only three new features this year all right yeah. actually actually Dana and Hassan I just want to say like a massive kudos on that because I joke around with people like I'll get on Twitch and broadcast if I'm doing something that I'm confident I'm not going to look like a complete like moron while I'm doing it. But like to be learning stuff live while mm -hmm. people are watching, like that mad respect for that because there's it no takes freaking a lot of way I would do it. <laughs> I must that's, say. All, that's all on Dana. <laughs> yeah. be, being on YouTube takes a lot of vulnerability. So that's that's you guys are all you guys are all put yourselves yeah. out here right now because YouTube comments are, are ruthless. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I'm not gonna lie. That's actually why I'm putting out a Dynamo video this week because like, I feel really stupid. I was like, I need my users to not think I'm I'm this dumb. No, you know what? You know what? You got to put it out there. I mean, I've got I've got three or four blog posts from you know ten years ago. Where where it's like see the update see the update see the update because it's usually <laughs> i learn something new or someone you know calls me out and realizes that I, you know and then i just put you just put it out there and you, you know all right, it is all what right. it is here confession time <laughs> oh, all right I, and i totally played this off uh when i updated the course uh essential training for 2022 this year like mm -hmm. like it was no big deal but i only just learned that when you're doing uh pick entire walls that you can pick more than one wall uh, and and you if you go back and watch my previous uh, courses where I show that tool, I'm like, and it kind of sucks that you can only pick one wall, and it's totally wrong. <laughs> can you can you, you can just you walk? Go pick the next wall. You don't even have to hold down the control key. <laughs> and it's like such a boneheaded move. And I was like, okay, so I'm gonna own it with you guys here live, but in the uh, in the new update to the course, I just play it off like I knew it all along, you know. <laughs> so. That's funny. I, <laughs> I, I I love when somebody points out something I don't know because you get that much stronger and oh that my much gosh. smarter. I um, just recently found out about in the material dialogue box in, in the very bottom left hand corner, there's the additional parameters ooh, button. Yeah. I I mean to be like, fair, to like be fair, that's changer. like that's like that is so I think it's meant to be hidden, hidden or something. That's, that's <laughs> so <laughs> hidden. Like no way that isn't meant to be No, hidden. if you're an interior designer, then you will find out, but I <laughs> if, yeah, I mean I find out late in the game as well until Oh like, my gosh. I li ah, literally yeah. within the last year found out from a from a user of mine that that button existed because it's like oh you have to go to the schedule to update these you know non-built-in parameters like no just oh, click oh that, that additional button. parameter mm -hmm. okay yeah i was like wait yeah. i gotta look for that <laughs> which <laughs> one which one <laughs> well when you get to materials there's so many buttons and dialogues oh and tabs God. that for it me it's the, the the little arrows menu that you have on the ribbon mm. you really have to be look carefully mm -hmm. to see these oh, right man. but when i when i discovered that site settings do when, you, when i when you minimize that, the oh windows <laughs> you mean is that what you mean nick when like uh, they, when they become like the little windows like the minimized version of the windows no, like, no, how did the, I the, do the that? additional settings is that what you mean the additional the 45, settings with the arrow the, 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 what, that's what 45 degree yeah. yeah someone just share someone just share it somebody we're all talking this if anyone everyone knows people out there might not know so um can i share yeah you can share i was trying to share i don't even know if my revit actually fully opened in the background so oh, okay oh there it is, it is. can you see it yes. we see your revit yep 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 oh yeah. I see. this that one, one. Yeah. Oh, this little yeah. thing oh, nice, nice. that even has a name there, there's a lot of really useful stuff in there for the there site is. oh my god yeah meanwhile and there's also one for the, the cat import over there mm -hmm. yeah for the the line weight i mean mm -hmm. that 
you really got to know it's there, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've also had a lot of users that will like minimize the windows accidentally using that little button on the right, Nick. Can yeah. you mm -hmm. share that really quickly? Then, oh, yeah. Which and, one? And then they're like, how did I, how do I get this back? Uh, which one? On the very far right of modify. All the way on the right, next to the modify, modify. Yeah. the top. Yeah, this one. To the no, right. No, to the no. right, to the right. Of modify. The other right. The other right. right. The other right. <laughs> This is Imperial, not metric system. system. All the way to the right. <laughs> uh, I'm all confused. So, uh, this my one, favorite. Me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this the one. Yeah, oh, yeah. That one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the first time I think that was like, oh my God, what what did I do? What happened? I so, ruined the ribbon. Doesn't work. The, the first time I accidentally held down control and dragged a ribbon to the wrong ends. And I was like, wait, you can move the ribbons? What's Actually, going on? And, John yeah. Pearson told me about that. And now, whenever mm -hmm. I take a screen capture, I like move the tab. Somebody, nice. somebody nice. wants us to show the the additional materials. So uh, I don't know if if, oh, yes. if someone wants to share. Yeah, I don't know. Do yes. know I, I, just quickly, I'm just before we go on, next. I just recently learned you can do this. On <gasps> oh, the yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, but I, I'm yeah. sure there's some but people in the chat that are like, every oh, dialogue. No, yeah, it's it's it doesn't work with every dialogue. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not every dialogue, but it's it's many of them. It's extremely yeah. frustrating mm -hmm. when you're teaching Revit in the families dialogue. If you zoom in and you click formulas, actually, I should show that real quick because it is. It is Show got. It is. It is. Yeah. Oh wait, wait. Um, yeah, I think this will work. Hold on. Hey, there he is. Oh. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I, I just realized we're streaming at the same time as Zoom, and I, oh man, oh man, oh man. So 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 this when I when I'm teaching my class on Wednesday nights to to students, this is probably one of my most frustrating things. So. If you if you're trying to show them formulas, for example, you know I like to zoom in so everyone can see the text because you know some yeah. people can't see the mm -hmm. text, and so it's great that you can control scroll. But the problem is if you go in here and you start scrolling, and then you click in here and you type, and then you add <laughs> another one, and you scroll again, it like tabs and, and it goes it goes on forever. Let me see if it's gonna let me do. It. I'll probably have to add no, more. You, get a, you don't have you're a parameter a called parameter. A -A 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 I'm going to need to add some parameters here, huh? Let me open one that, that already has parameters. How about that? That's probably a good idea. <laughs> uh, I'm in the blank, blank template also, and I was like, oh, look at that. I don't have that button. Let's see if I have a family open already. Bookcase line base, this might have you it. could have made a parameter by now. Ah, come on. <laughs> come on. All right, this one might work. Let's see. Yeah, see, you've already messed up your dialogue because you zoomed it once. Yep, so I zoomed it once. So now, I, look, at, look at that. See? So first it clicks over and it, it scrolls over there. Yep, so yep. you're trying to do that. And then if you zoom in we more. We agree that this dialogue sucks. It does. It sucks. It's, yeah. And so oh you can God. go like this and it jumps back and forth. And then sometimes it'll tab for eternity and then you can't get back. Oh my God, yep. it drives me nuts. So yep. if anyone is, is taking a Revit class um, and that's happening, um, you know, give give this teacher some, 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 some slack there because <laughs> it's not their fault. Hey, Asan, <laughs> I have a question for you. Uh -huh. um, so so hang on dana had brought up this one earlier and somebody asked to see it so this is oh, yeah. the button additional parameters here uh, yeah that's so one. so if you're in a material and you've added like shared parameters to the materials this little button right down here will make them pop up oh i had no um, idea right nice. yeah i don't have that button i thought that, that i had to go have have edit those in the schedule you, well so so you I'm won't have like so noob. so here's I'm the thing so the button the button will not show up in the ui unless you've added a shared parameter to the material category the yeah. it needs to be two What's, materials yeah not just any shared parameter it has to be a shared yeah. parameter and, for materials <laughs> yeah and what's oh, hilarious no, it so, could be it could be project parameter too i've done it before oh but project parameter. for the materials category yeah as long as it's a yeah okay sorry yeah yeah right 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 material category custom parameter on the materials category Custom okay. parameter, yep. and that's it's what always, the, if you hover over the button, that's what it says. Custom parameters. It's oh, always okay. hilarious it's to me <laughs> that we have this whole window that pops up this size, and there's just like all this area <laughs> sitting right here. Right, right, F. right. F for whoever designed this. Uh, <laughs> well, they 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 grabbed this, I think, from 3D Studio, the material editor for Revit. It yeah. came from another software, I think, and they didn't mm. want to mess with it, so they added that extra one to. Get oh yeah, it. I mean, I mean, that thing has gone through some iterations. Let me tell you, material, yeah. <laughs> material. I, I do have a question for you guys. Have you been using the physical materials for renderings? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When yeah. I use when I use Enscape, I try to use as many physically based materials and mm -hmm. add as many as I can for sure. Yeah, yeah. I've heard yeah. a lot of good things about them. I've played a little bit with them, but not enough to like to be. Uh... They just look way better. Yeah, yeah. they do. I am... mm -hmm. Yeah. They, uh, I think, I think Paul, you said you had a question for Asan. Oh, yeah. was it? Uh, Asan, it, can can you make a custom language in Notepad plus plus for the family editor? 
So actually, so I started this project a long time ago, and I never got to got to finish it. I started this iteration of this that was uh, uh, creating a very simple language to define Revit templates. Yeah. So you could just do this and then run it, and it would generate the template for you. Stuff like this yeah. is, is technically possible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, when you when you get back to that, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shamila, Shamila, who's a regular, said, my goal for this year is to completely understand what all of you are talking about. <laughs> That's our goal for this year, too. Don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. One day, it, what'll happen is, is as time goes on, you'll you'll learn something be like, oh, that's that thing. Oh, that's that thing. We've all been down it. We've all been down that road. <laughs> I just hosted, right before this, I just hosted our uh, local uh, sh- Chicago user group here that we have, uh, Dynamo. Uh, I call it Shinamo. Um, and Jeff and I have done many uh, uh, crossover events with that. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had a guy on there, our uh, two gentlemen on to do the uh, Sparrow package, and they were doing all these MEP tools. And I was completely clueless the whole time. But I'm playing along, and I'm you know asking questions, and you know trying to moderate and stuff. But I had no idea what he was talking about. You know, it was all this uh, MEP stuff that you know is just not my area of expertise. So um, <laughs> you know, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, Ernesto asked, and I'm curious to see anyone's thoughts because I actually don't have much thoughts on this. I haven't used it in a long time. He's, he asked about Formit and if any of us have opinions, thoughts, or have used it a lot or, or whatnot. So I'd, be, I'd love to hear if anyone between the seven of us, I could tell you from my experience, I haven't used it in probably three or four years. So I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to weigh in on that one. <laughs> yeah. But if anyone else I'd has. I'd love to find a Formit user. like like a legit workflow and and, yeah 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 yeah. going back to the conversation on university and students and their access i keep telling autodesk the way to get form it and the adoption of that is to throw it at students like get Mm. students really good at it right rather than using uh rhino and all the other tools which they should still use right they like don't not use those tools but get them to lo- learn this also mm-hmm. and then they come into the studio into the actual practice studio knowing these types of tools and how to a- apply them mm-hmm. you know and and you know we can get then the practitioners involved into this workflow because otherwise i don't think it's going to happen well, I mean, if they can convince the the college not to use SketchUp and switch it to Formit, that might be, that might work, right? Yes. I think I, so. I I commend Autodesk for what they want to do with Formit, and I commend the additions that have been made to Revit to make Formit more palatable. Mm-hmm. However, I'm trying to say this without sounding like an asshole. Um, <laughs> it's all right. It's YouTube. <laughs> when, when geometry comes in from Formit, whether they've made it more palatable to break that geometry apart or not, it is still going through a software translation. And I'm not a programmer, so Asan could definitely speak to this better. But what's so powerful about something like Rhino Inside or interfacing Dynamo and Grasshopper <laughs> is you're essentially telling Revit to rebuild the logic mm-hmm. that was in Rhino. When you bring in SketchUp and try to put stuff on it, it's hammered trash. And when you bring in Formit and turn it into a massing object or try to turn it into walls on top of it, next time you find somebody who's built a Formit model and it has angles in it, take a dimension style, set it to 13 decimal points and start dimensioning that stuff. And it's the <laughs> same crap you had when you were tracing AutoCAD. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. it's something- Seems like in... that's the general consensus in the chat also. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, no one seems to be a fan of it in the chat yeah. either. So there's uh, like there's like one, we'll say this. There's like one format <laughs> user like, oh man. I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I, I do put format like, you know, two steps above SketchUp because I yes. consider SketchUp like the Chevette of modeling. At least it's modeling. translatable. Um, <laughs> you know. You can do something with it. Oh man, But I mean yes. like, but, I mean, like what you can do with Rhino and Rhino inside, or even just Rhino and something like uh, what's what's Nate Miller's app? Conveyor. That, uh, Conveyor. Thank you. Yeah. Really. Awesome stuff. Yeah. With, I'm, with, I'm with... baffled though that students don't have access to this stuff. Like like yeah, Carl's saying you. here, they, totally. like, they totally should have access to the full AC collection. Like if you, if you want mm-hmm. students learning this stuff, give them access. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. absolutely absurd. You're gonna get a bunch of you know. Uh, rhino users and and uh and sketchup users and that's and then they jump into studios and yeah yeah wondering do you guys think there's a way to fix the model in place tool in revit so there could be kind of a quick modeling 
way or, or even the conceptual model. massing tool yeah. Design Rabbit, right? Make, I mean, make I, it more if, pushable, I mean, I'm like, a Revit yeah. user. <laughs> if somebody were to ask me to create a design in Revit or a design in general, I would use Revit, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm a Revit user. I know right. Asana's like, why? Like his eyes got big. <laughs> what are you talking about? You said that out loud. <laughs> I'm a Revit user, right? Yep. Like that's yeah. what it comes oh, yeah. down to. I'm not a Rhino user as much as I want to be. And I would, you know, Maybe after mm -hmm. Python, so I can get to that. Um, I'll, I'll learn Rhino and Grasshopper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's tough. Yeah. It's, it's really difficult. Can I, uh, Jeff? Can I take one of the questions? Has already scrolled way past. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I'm, I was going to say for the chat for people still hanging on. Um, if we miss your question and you really want to answer, just keep, <laughs> just keep asking it. <laughs> so because yeah, when I'm rolling up, it's just like it's mayhem. The chat. It, it's absolute mayhem. Well, yeah, don't ask too many times, but try try and make sure it's on the bottom if you really want to ask. Because I'm rolling up and down, and it's it's mayhem over here. So so yeah. so, so for sure. Go ahead, Paul. There was a good one out there. Yeah. So I'm gonna. Uh, <clears throat> this is about mesh modeling. Uh, that there was a question on that, and um, I just want to point out uh, that I've actually done some work on this. So. Uh, so I don't want to listen to myself talk here, but um, in my, uh, this is subscription based, my apologies. So if you don't have access to LinkedIn learning, then you wouldn't be able to watch this particular video, but I also have a, sor a, a source of the same information that's free that I'll point out in a minute. But um, hiding edges of imported geometry on 3D meshes, there's this really complicated and painful workflow that you can do when you get mesh geometry to bring it into a Revit family and make it actually usable. Um, and uh, Andy Milburn has actually blogged about this as well. So there's lots of sources out there, possibly Phil, uh, you might've done some of this too. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, believe it or not, the secret sauce is DXF 2004. <laughs> Don't ask me why. But uh, <laughs> you, you go through a program and you save it out to a DX, like Max, for example, you mm -hmm. hide all the edges, you export it out to DXF 2004. And then when you bring that into a Revit family, all the edges will stay invisible. Hmm. So instead of getting ugly tessellation, you actually get nice looking uh, geometry. So um, on my website, there's a uh, written version of this that's free. So if you go to paulobin.com and you click on conferences, um, it's going to be under family editor over here. And it's this one called Beyond the Basics. And there's a handout here. And I'll just... Um, scroll down my apologies that there's no page numbers at the bottom of the pages but if you look over here you go to about page 17 and um imported imported geometry and there's a just this is what it looks like if you don't do this hack and this is what it looks like if you do mm -hmm. and it's just a world of difference so this was a statue that i scanned with a laser scanner and you know went through a series of steps to get it into a mesh model and then this was the result in the family editor um after running it through this hack. So it's it's not a simple process. It's actually kind of painful, but once you get the hang of it, it's not hard to do. It's just a lot of steps, but um, you can, you know, and I hear I'm showing the whole thing. And then a little further down, there's some airplanes, which is another, you know, example of this, right? Like these are mesh models that I forget where they came from somewhere on the internet. Here, I'm being a little bit more systematic about keeping some of the edges visible. So like if you want to see the outlines around the windows or maybe the edges of the wings or something, um, so you can get this result when you bring it into Revit. So you don't have to make every edge invisible. You can decide which ones you want to keep visible. Um, but this is mesh geometry. And one last thing, if it's watertight, I don't think I say that in this paper, but if it's watertight and you bring it into a cuttable category like generic model, you can slice through this thing and it will section and you'll get a beautiful profile around this. So I know the general rule of thumb is everybody's like, never bring in CAD geometry. <laughs> well, yeah, don't just bring it in unless you process it the hell out of it. But mm. if you process the hell out of it and you know what you're doing, you can mm. bring in uh, geometry from mesh software and get really nice results in uh, Revit with it. And in fact, if you compare file sizes here, I don't know if this is visible. <clears throat> um, I don't know if I can make this bigger here. Um, but if you look at those file sizes, I challenge you to create an airplane model in the uh, traditional family editor that's less than 500K. You're not going to do it. have one. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, unless you're Aaron, I challenge you to, uh, to do that. So anyway, that's, um, uh, I don't know if that's exactly what the question was asking about, but uh, it seemed kind of like up my alley there. So I thought I would take that one. Yeah, that's Paul, a, that's have a good you, tip though. Definitely a good tip. Have you... Have we have, have we tried that with the custom asset with Enscape? Uh, I kind of wonder if this thing can go hand in hand together. I mean, that sounds like uh, maybe a possible. Enscape assets. Yeah, mm. the custom yeah. asset. 
I, I've just started playing with custom Enscape assets. Believe it or not, I didn't get an Enscape license until just a few months ago. So I'm uh, relatively new on that. But uh, that is something I'm exploring as well. I'll, yeah. I'll try something. I'll probably share some some books with you then. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Yeah, I'm hoping I'm hoping to do do an episode soon with on Enscape 3.0. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, but yeah, the 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 as the Enscape assets editor is phenomenal and and for Enscape, but still, you know, it's not necessarily designed to create geometry to in Revit. You know, it's designed to create proxy geometry that looks good in Enscape. So there's a little bit of a a, a difference there, but at the same time, it does. But their stuff is a little nicer than like RPCs because you actually yeah. get some sort of 3D geometry. So oh yeah, yeah those are their meshes. They're 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 yeah, actual 3D definitely geometry. Something yes. I'm looking yeah. at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there, there, may cool a, thing, there may be there may be something there. Yeah. I, I just had the. Uh, Josh Rattle uh, on my show and he works for Enscape mm -hmm. and he showed me a, a lot of cool tricks and one that I really like, he can now assign uh, Enscape assets to existing Revit families. Mm -hmm. So let's say oh, you yeah. have uh, an Enscape bench asset, but mm -hmm. you don't want to see kind of that weird looking mm -hmm. uh, Nintendo 64 like geometry in your Revit model, when you can just assign it to another uh, furniture family you already use in Revit. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is a airplane. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, but you get a seam there on the fuselage. I, I love the multitasking that's happening there, Aaron. <laughs> I'm trying. This this little champion just skinned her knees riding her bike outside. Oh, that's oh. Uh, having a rough day. <laughs> I forgot you're you're a little behind on time. I was like, wait a minute, it's like nine o'clock here. You're riding your bike outside. <laughs> what is happening here? <laughs> Not as dark there. Yeah. So can can I take one question from the chat because yeah. it's one of my favorites? Go for it. So John Gray asks, how many of you at your place of work require the use of shared coordinates for all projects? So mm -hmm. let me preface this by saying um, I'm spoiled because uh, I'm basically in charge. But um, yeah, absolutely. But not because I'm opinionated and I want it my way, because if you go back- You are that though. Maybe. <laughs> both, both, of those things, the, both of those things, that's okay. <laughs> if you go back through the history of the three coordinate systems, really shared coordinates all the time is the only reliable way to do things correctly if you consider all parties for the lifespan of the project. Because internal to internal, you can't guarantee that all design consultants have the internal origin in the same spot. Project base is just a hot mess that never should have been exposed to anybody freaking ever. No. Uh, and shared, we even do, I'll go one step further. We do shared on every project and we do multiple shared on every project. We have actually oriented properly on site and orthogonal at zero, zero, zero for 3D coordination because nobody, be right you'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> she heard you talking about she coordinate systems. She was like, I'm out. Sorry. I'm out. <laughs> She's like, I'm out. This conversation. You're talking, sucks. you're talking origins and base points. But, 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 here, but here's the cool thing. I'm with her, man. I'm out of here. <laughs> but, but, but I get Morphle now, and this is legit, right? I get to watch Morphle. There you oh, go. God. There you go. <laughs> I, I will add as as oh, now God. now God. since my my 40 hour a week role is is typically downstream use that. Shared coordinates is the only way to go for for downstream use. It, any other way, it just makes my life miserable <laughs> downstream and trying to figure out between all these parties. And so the first thing I ask design teams is that. And if they don't have an answer, I already know I'm screwed, right? And if they, if they tell me it's shared, usually I'm in good good condition. They tell me, oh, it's just the project or the the origin point or something like that. I'm like, all right, we're probably screwed too. And then so, so shared is definitely so, uh, for multi <laughs> multidisciplinary setups as long as as long as it's understood and designed from the start that way, right? It's 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 usually, I think, probably one of the successful routes, right? I would, I would imagine. And so one more piece of knowledge about those coordinate systems that sort of lays bare why it's imperative that everybody be in shared. Um, one thing I want to point out is the coordinate, the coordinate systems have different names in different dialogue boxes. And the one that is called internal origin is not project base. Now, where that gets weird is if you go to export a CAD plan of your project, it says mm -hmm. project internal. That's the internal origin. It's not project base. So if you've relied on project base for the origins, there is no way to actually export properly. So you mm -hmm. get stuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sh shout out to the first episode I did with the uh... Uh, with Jeff, yeah, or, uh, about, that was like uh, episode coordinates. three or something, that? man. That was I'll, I'll post a link to that, but yeah, Nick did a great explanation of the the three kind of base points and how they all kind of interact and showed a shared coordinates, and uh, mm -hmm. it is something that I would say, yeah, phasing. 
design options and coordinate uh-huh. systems are probably the three things that I get the most questions about in, in the community yeah, that, that, I, that I run and as well I'll as tell you just what, yeah, people I, I know on my website and it's the are easy in I, comparison I, <laughs> in comparison to coordinates as far as conceptual <laughs> understanding yes yes <laughs> it's the most popular post on my website to this day like it was released in yeah. 2018 I just get so many it's about it mm-hmm. you know what my most popular video is because you walk into a room of crowded Revit users and you say one of three things the two you've already mentioned and view range and everybody's <laughs> going to turn their head because they all want to hear what you have to say right so it's like so view range shared coordinates you know phasing design options absolutely these are like the ones that everybody's baffled by it doesn't matter how much of an expert they are mm-hmm. they're all like they they're all convinced there's something they still need to know about it mm-hmm. you know? so we haven't we haven't made them available yet but because we can't go do any of our training for clients in person this year we actually went through and started converting all of our training to video libraries. And so there's about an hour's worth of all of the different coordinate theory videos and multiple building instances, garden style projects, which DM branch from the chat asked us to create a video on and setting up coordinates and all that kind of, it it sucks that you need an hour's worth of videos to get through that. Right. Um, But (laughs) I'm loving that notion. Oh, we got that from you, man. Uh, John, roll, John rolled up after noticing that you were using it on Twitter. And he's like, holy cow, this is so much better than Trello. And we looked at it for like an hour and Trello died a short death 30 mm-hmm. days later in our first. I've heard, I've heard, I've heard great things. I've heard great things about Notion. I have not. I have yet to, to use it myself, but I've heard some great things. Who sets control point? Someone, Eric asked, who sets the control point? Architect, structural, or civil? Whoever's so, there first. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's almost always going to be the architect, but yeah, I mean, somebody's got to, you know, depending Sometimes on the, the job. Yeah. Well, I, I, th- I think before you can answer the question, you have to define control point. Right. Because there's, there's you know, coordinate at the corner of the building or where zero is going to be for orthogonal coordination. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and I, I watch architects and civil engineers and structural engineers all fight about this. I'm like, it's really basic. You know, architects want to design a building and then there is a site plan with a legitimate survey and we can give the civil engineer the footprint of the building. And I want a PDF with a coordinate and an angle at the corner of it. I don't want anybody's DWG. I don't want to acquire anything. I don't want to, I want a number typed out to five decimal points, northing and easting and an angle down to three decimal points and we'll do it ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, That's a great point. Fair enough. <laughs> so, so anyone who's wondering chicken before the egg type of thing, um, it's, you know, as Aaron just mentioned, yeah, I think the architect is usually the one who sets the standard because they're the ones who first create the model usually. But there is what Aaron's meant. Yeah, there, there's there's still a standard that they can pull from usually on every job anyway. So in general, the other thing, too, is uh, honestly, make sure everyone knows and really... like write it somewhere and tell people about it, whether it's a BIM execution plan or it's just like uh, yeah. something somewhere that yeah, people can that. tell other people what it is. <laughs> that, that would be nice, too. That would be super nice. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. I mean, but honestly, that's the that's the reason why we, I mean, whether they implemented it properly or not, put that aside, right? Because everybody has their complaints about how coordinates is set up in Revit, but the whole idea that there's project coordinates and shared coordinates and, you know, a project base point in a, in a shared base point and all these is for that exact reason, because the architect just cares about grid a one or the lower left-hand corner of the building or whatever it is. And then the site guy cares about, you know, the, the benchmark on site, you know, the iron pipe in the, in the corner of the property or the manhole cover or whatever they're using as their, uh, as their benchmark, right. Um, you know, the, the GIS marker or whatever it is. Um, and so the idea that you, you should have a coordinate system that can reconcile the two is the exactly the point. Um, but it gets lost in all the terminology and the confusion in the stupid little icons and all that you know yeah but um, and also there's actually four origin points like the project base point the survey point the shared site origin which can be different from the survey point but not always internal, yeah and yeah. the, the product you know so <laughs> i think that's why <laughs> right. everybody's well, confused about it I mean, again the implementation you know is is, yeah. is dicey mm-hmm. right i mean that's all i'm saying but conceptually you know mm-hmm. i mean i think they were onto something there you know because everybody talks about AutoCAD, like, oh, well, why isn't it like AutoCAD? Because AutoCAD, like, you just arbitrarily pick some zero zero that doesn't mean anything. And by the way, how many times have you opened up an AutoCAD drawing and done zoom extents and everything disappears because nobody paid attention to the zero zero anyway? So, mm-hmm. like, everybody acts like it's so sacred, but it's only sacred if people actually follow it and use it, you know? Mm-hmm. So, I, I, I don't think, know. I think that's I, actually, I, at least it's I, visible I, now. 
<laughs> so, so ironically, um, I, you know, why doesn't it work like AutoCAD? I don't think it did better in AutoCAD. We just didn't try to tag it or show it across the different files. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so Dana's point though, like th this is huge. Like the fact that they made it visible, I think is great. Uh, the fact that they put the paperclip on it, I think, was a disaster. <laughs> mm. uh, I mean, everybody who was using Revit back in 8.1, there were there were a number of us on the call. If you were doing coordinates back in 8.1, you couldn't see anything, but mm -hmm. there was only one way to set it. And you know what? It was easier. It was better. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, I agree with Dana. I love that you can see it now. I just hate that they gave you five ways to move it. And I'm, I'm on a Reddit thread and somebody's like, click the paperclip, unclick the paperclip. You know what? Take the paperclip out of the program. Yeah. Well, they're, they're starting to do that. I though, thought it was still, I thought it was still fixed. I thought it was still the origin you couldn't move. That's no, the origin the case. There is talking, one. He's talking yeah, about this one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was yeah, like yeah. the okay. internal origins visible, but it has a paperclip. No, uh, no, that's <laughs> fair. You're right. You're right. It's, uh, <laughs> okay. The, the other two, the other two. Yeah, like the whack -a somebody, somebody asked if the elevation matters. I think it absolutely does. I mean, totally. the, you, we're talking about 3D coordinates here. It's not just X oh, and Y. Oh, totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to quickly you share an article level, I, I wrote right? on, on my blog, which is called Understanding Revit's Mysterious Survey Point. I love your <laughs> graphics, Nick, by the way. I wanted to Thanks. tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> so because I got so many questions and so many contradictions about the survey point, and nobody understands that there's the, the shared site origin, which is different from the survey point itself. And some people say you should never move the survey point away from the shared site origin. Some people say no, you should always move it away. So <laughs> I, I kind of went through this whole thing. But coordinates, it, no matter how long you talk about it, you could you could do it I forever. Like you confuse yourself talking about yeah. it. I, I, yeah, I will tell you. <laughs> like you get to the end of talking about it, and you're like, yeah. was that right? I think yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I confuse myself. Yeah, yeah, you get into some sort of existential crisis at some yeah. point. I, I yeah. will tell you, so we, we probably, you know, I, I probably start, we probably start 30 to 40 projects a year. So I get to see models from, and they're all multidisciplinary, large, you know, large projects. I would venture to say there's maybe not even half that are set up correctly, you know, coordinate systems. Uh, those, and these are, you know, some of them billion dollar jobs. And, and, and I would, I'm, I am always shocked when I get to go shared coordinates. It works. Everything aligns up. I'm shocked because that's how, how often it doesn't happen you know it's is yeah, that I literally it, it, today <laughs> got a call from an electrical engineer who or sorry mechanical engineer who says everything just moved eight inches and oh, i don't i don't know God. what happened and i i'm like okay that's share bad. your screen <laughs> right and of course it has a shared site so it can't be pinned it can't be unpinned it can't be moved like everything is locked and so i got, you know i start talking through these three ambiguous freaking point <laughs> like nobody and he's like okay wait can you back up three points <laughs> yep, yep. so it, yeah it's really confusing and to the end of it i was like literally you know one of my colleagues could come in here right now and say you just said everything wrong and i would i would like okay do you want to do you want to please better explain it because i obviously have no idea and i would agree that i had no idea there's also a very, very secret, secret hidden feature that if you add a shared parameter to materials, the clip behind that origin will show off. One hundred percent. There will be buttons nice. behind buttons. Wait, 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 wait. People are going to put it in the chat. They're going to think you're serious. <laughs> Nicely done. Everyone's furiously looking at Revit right now. Wait a minute. What the yeah. hell? Well, I'm glad also that Gavin didn't know that that button existed. So at least like all of us didn't know that it existed. We can all agree that that button yeah, that should was, be bigger. That was, that was a Revit really pro tip. <laughs> Oh, I'll show you. Nick, somebody just uh, somebody just called you out and said that your tutorials are the perfect level, and mine can get a little dry. Oof! Ooh. <laughs> ah, a little dry. Boy, oh, man, I told you, you gotta have thick skin for YouTube, man. I'm telling you, you gotta, wow. you gotta. Oh, guys, be easy, <laughs> be easy on me. Yep. <laughs> we're not. We're here to have fun, people, man. Oh, you yeah, can't. You can't. Are extracurricular. Oh, you can't see it because it got dark in the office. But I still have a book over there, open to the page that says, "My editor and I disagree on this point." <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> and as always, Paul, I respect your right to be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. I respect your right to have yeah, a bad opinion. Yeah. Let's 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 all be nice and and let's all I'm thank everyone. Thank kidding. yeah. Let's all thank everyone though, for however, our contributions. I didn't say to Paul that Bill DeBubick wanted me to call you Captain Revit. 
Uh, yeah, that's nice. Holly is the one that I learned Revit from. Like, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Well, mostly Maybe, because yeah. of the picture, right? Does, does Bill know captain. that you pronounce his name perfectly, even though he's still fumbled on yours? Is no, he, he actually tonight, literally right before this, we had a podcast and he actually pronounced it perfectly. <laughs> okay, so yeah, he's, it's taken him two years or so only. Yeah. Can um, I say though, we have like the toughest, the toughest industry. Like I get anxiety looking at everybody's names. When we all meet in person once a year, I'm like, oh shit, here we go. Just Dana I, mean, is fine. <laughs> I think I'm the only one. Dana Mo. I'd go I by Dana Mo too. I mean, we all have right? like, like we all have like two names. We have like the real names and then we have like <laughs> the, Twitter, the Twitter handles. handles, but then like the real <laughs> like names are super names. complicated because we're all from all over the world. And I'm like <laughs> mm -hmm. looking at people's names and I'm like, I don't want to try to say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> we had a, we had a pass this year because no one had to see each other in person right <laughs> I, and my anxiety is a lot better <laughs> all well, right let's did, did, did you get the memo that au is going to be virtual again this year oh they already made the the announcement that it is yeah i saw the the, the newsletter whatever oh, really? said. I, yeah. i've got a survey basically asking would you still attend if it was uh, virtual would you come if it was not but i didn't know what was announced yeah, I got a newsletter email mm. saying that I think they're, they're opening the submission for AGU class, but it's going to be virtual again this year. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I guess you think about it. It's a lot of commitment for an unknown still, right? I mean, it's probably a safe move until, I mean. I'm glad they know. did that because honestly, yeah. I would have been just like, well, no, I'm not going to. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm not going anyway. Yeah, yeah. About it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's probably what, what they figured, right? It's like how many people would actually go, even if even if we're allowed to have it or, you know, what percentage of people are going to be comfortable going. So, I mean, when how many people yeah. are we going to be able to have in a conference hall? You know, right. I mean, with the like, restrictions on yeah. that, even we're yeah. going to pay it, all this money. Totally. No, it's kind I of, mean, it, it's kind of funny that you, we are in the same group that we are on the same mentality. Whereas like the, on a different day, I would be in a different room and it would be a different conversation yeah. that we have. <laughs> That's part yeah, of the problem. I mean, right? I mean, I mean, <laughs> Philip, we live in the we live in the same city, and yeah. <laughs> I'm with you there. We're, we're gonna, as an I'm East just, Coaster, yeah. I'm just gonna stop it there. Yeah, I'm not gonna exactly. say a word. As, as somebody who, East Coast. hey, I I <laughs> born and born and raised in New York, and I miss All it right. right now. So let's um, uh let's see if there's are there any any burning questions that we see before we wrap yeah, up today. I, I think there was a good one. I'm wondering why it's hard to find someone creating Revit structure and MVP content. Mm. I, I wasn't wondering, do we have any good mm. resources for a structure and MVP? I'll, I'll tell you why, because those firms pay their people a lot better so they don't feel like they need to leave and become consultants. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't need they don't need wow. the side gig to make it oh, <laughs> burn. Wow. Oh man. Unless architects weren't getting paid well in practice so we decided to become consultants. <laughs> I actually The scary actually part about it is architects out. pay the the engineers so how does that work <laughs> you know they don't have any I, money I actually, to pay their own people <laughs> i had to pull i had to pull out the structural library that me and scott wilson at la feast built for shikamberg built 2013 <laughs> where we had all the modeled fireproofing on it because i needed it mm. for a project this week mm. yeah and, and and whether we're talking about content itself or even learning content i know there's a lack of learning content too and so um, mm. there are a couple guys out there and I, it, the name escapes me but i'll find them and i'll post it in the, that that are doing some some of the stuff and uh, yeah yeah I, I, carl tanner i think doing yeah. from new zealand doing a revit structure blog mm -hmm. that is pretty uh, pretty good yeah. And yeah, I always get get questions about MEP in my live sessions. I'm like, sorry, can't help you. And I always fa feel bad for these yeah. people. They don't have that much resources. Yeah, I did MEP for dummies as no, one of my episodes really last year. Tough. So you guys can check that one out too. But it is tough. I will, I will actually say that, you know, thank goodness for MEP over. I hope I'm saying that package correctly um, because whoever mm. is, I know, should know the person's name who created this. They are amazing. Like, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so M much. Because -E even over? like the MEP over, I believe is the name of it. And because even when you Google things about electrical circuits and electrical systems, it's mm. really difficult to find <laughs> things about. And like, I'm like the person to tell you like, oh, just Google it and put Revit or Dynamo at the end and you'll find something. No, <laughs> like, you don't understand. It's it's actually really difficult. So I feel like, yeah, I, maybe I will do something on that. Uh, it's not my field, but I've been trying to help the electrical and mechanical peeps. But it's <laughs> it is it's really difficult, especially not knowing it. And I don't. I, it's like hard even to create like a test file <laughs> yeah. for it. Um, but yeah. no, I feel for you guys. So. Yeah, I, I I go as far as just teaching what 
architects should know so sort of basics of it but never getting into the detailed system stuff i will say that i think um there is and not to um I'm, I'm gonna try not to offend all the MEP guys out there, but uh, now you know, working on the construction side for six years, um, I do think that um, we're creating a double-edged sword on the construction side that has a downstream effect on the engineers, and that's with our 3D coordination process. And so, I'm actually planning on doing an episode on this because I do think there's an unknown for a lot of design teams uh, as far as the 3D coordination Navis clash and what's happening on on the field with that stuff. Um, but what happens, and I hear this because I sit in meetings and with with engineers, and I I ask them, and and you know why aren't you modeling to this level? Why aren't you taking it? Why aren't you know what? It, and you they say sometimes you're just going to remodel it because the subcontractor is remodeling it to detail and making it fit. So my argument is, well, if you made it fit in the first place, it would make the other part of it much easier. But <laughs> but I think we're creating a double edged sword there because then they don't need to take their models beyond modeling for documentation because i think that's a big issue with engineering engineering is still model for documentation i mean architecture still is too let's be honest but but i I like to think that there's a an existential thought of of the model-based approach downstream and 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 thinking more about it whereas uh, you know mvp and and i don't know how that leads into content existing and where it is maybe there's not enough feed for it maybe there's not enough people wanting to do it but i do think that that's an issue that that you know, a platform like this, maybe we could help, help solve or figure out or get to the bottom of. And it's the sort of, I feel like engineers take it to a point and they stop and they could take it further than they do. And that, that's just well, so- and changing gears a little bit. And just to go, cause I know we've had a few questions on it and in, in the chat. And so to get back to interiors, cause I know there was a question on finished plans Mm-hmm. Um, Steven just asked about in- right. tools for so interiors. So let's let's do this. Let's wrap up MEP and then we'll finish with interiors as a last okay, topic. Let's, let's do, do that. that. So I think Aaron, you might have had a little bit to say on MEPs or I, I, <laughs> I did. Side. I mean, so I, I did. I mean, the whole MEP engineer versus MEP subcontractor thing, I think, is an interesting dynamic. And the one difference I would say there, right, is both MEP and structure get you know what I would call superseded because shop drawings have to happen and shop drawings are required to do a lot more than design drawings are. So mm-hmm. by definition, I can't fault an MEP engineer who doesn't want to model to a higher level of detail because they're 100% correct. Their mm-hmm. model is going to get replaced later. Now, mm-hmm. that's not an excuse to do a lousy job, but <laughs> when, you, when you start talking to MEP engineers and you want to ask them to start doing things like hangers and fittings, mm-hmm. I think we are overreaching because they are never going to be the party responsible for setting hangers. So I think there's some validity in there. Mm-hmm. I'm bummed about what MEP fab tools became because the Revit construction to, or the architecture construction tools don't replace the element. They redundantly duplicate mm-hmm. and augment the element. Whereas the MVP ones just trash the entire model, which kind of sucks. <laughs> yes. And then, then you're like, what happened? I can't, I can't, I can't do it. Yeah. Anything. But, but also yeah. there's this, there, so, so, I mean, the obvious solution and unfortunately it doesn't go this way is yeah. If the design model is going to get superseded, then for the design engineers and the subs to be collaborating on the one unified model earlier. Mm -hmm. The problem is I've done that in design build firms. I did it when I worked at BAC where where Philip works now. And the problem is what ends up happening in that arrangement is the design engineers try to draw as little as possible and Mm -hmm. the subcontractors try to model as late as possible because they only (laughs) want to do it once and then everything is worse. Yep. So yeah. It's, yeah, uh, we do quite a bit of MEP design and SYST, and yeah, it's just, it has to be set up correctly from the beginning, and mm-hmm. it's still, it's not always a win-win, right? And and I would I would say I agree with you, and and to me, it's even less about the level of detail, but it's more about making shit fit. Like if totally. you're going to model it, it does it could be a six by six duct. It doesn't have to have flange. It doesn't have to have hangers, but just make it fit in the space you're given in 3D. Is if that fits, then you know we know it's gonna fit from the beginning. Because the biggest totally, issue you totally. have in coordination is, well, this doesn't fit. Okay, uh-huh. well, we need to move it. Okay, well, you move it, you move it. Well, we have to get a confirmation from the design team. They have to confirm this is the route we're gonna take. Back and forth, back and yep. forth, and then yep. four weeks later, you've decided that this is the move for the one duct. And and so, so that's why yeah. it's not the level of detail. Even it's more of give me the size and make sure it fits in the space that is given to you. <laughs> like that's yeah, it. Absolutely. Just make sure it so, fits in there. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, just, just before we jump back to interiors, cause I think that was an awesome point that, that Dana brought up, but before mm-hmm. we do, I mean, we actually had a project where we did our reconciliation modeling, you know, where we took everything to more detail to show the contractor and the project ended up getting scrapped 
hmm. because there was a point in time when some MEP penetrations through steel were shown oh, diag- pens. Oh, man. They, they, they were single line <laughs> diagrams. And I'm not making this up. I mean, it was an 18 inch penetration through an 18 inch beam. We were like, so. <laughs> Where's that going to go? Nice. Uh, you know, raise I, the I'll, building, I'll, uh, lower the ceiling. What do you want? <laughs> we we deal with beam penetrations all the time. I will give. I will leave. I will leave MEP with this one point. Beam penetrations are two and a half x in the field than they cost in the shop. So think mm. about that as far as the budget's concerned. You know, if it's thirteen hundred dollars in the shop, it's you know four thousand dollars in the field per beam penetration. So just as a design team, think about that and what that can do to a budget on a job. If you have a ten story building, there's four thousand beam penetrations, four hundred even. You know, you're talking about a four to five million dollar risk by not having those in place. So huge that's a huge spot in my in my heart, beam penetrations. <laughs> All right. Interiors. So I, I missed a few of the questions I saw a few. I don't know if you guys are following along. What was the sort of gauge of well, the, of so the there questions was a, and there was one question about modeling finishes and that, that, that was early on there was a, mm-hmm. a more recent question about um tagging walls from the architectural model and i'm not sure how to help you there that's not a problem that i've that i've necessarily witnessed and i'm i apologize it's probably just not brought to my attention ff and e over here i see it ff and e um, linked linked models from architects and t- tagging the walls yeah Having... i don't know that I've known that as an issue, but I will say that finishes are an issue. And I was actually literally on the call with Jacob Small today at one o'clock Eastern and talking about why we're recreating the wheel on tagging finishes. Like this, this can't, we're not the only ones, right? Who have to tag accent walls and all of these other things. Like not everybody is just doing it in text, right? (laughs) And I mean, it's on the Revit roadmap. I don't know about you guys. Does it feel like the Revit roadmap got everything on it? Like maybe that was like a response to the letter or something. <laughs> like we're just gonna we're just gonna throw everything on the roadmap and just make sure everybody is happy. But we're not gonna give anybody a timeline in terms of when any of this is gonna be ready. Or <laughs> we hear you. We're only working on these two things, but we hear all of um, these things. <laughs> but. You know, I, I think it, it is a dilemma of like, how how do we, it, luckily at Smith Group, and I actually have a background in interior design. I went to school for interior design. My first few, very few um, <laughs> jobs were in interior design. And then I went into base building architecture because I was pretty good at Revit. Hmm. And interiors didn't want to use Revit, right? And so it was like a slow start. Hmm. But luckily at Smith Group, we have actually a course called All Revit All the Time, where we try to get people to use Revit for everything that they need to within the interiors, whether it's signage, whether it's finishes, whether it, wh- whatever it might be. The one problem that I have is that you can't tag a painted surface in plan, right? Mm-hmm. So like, what do you do with the surfaces that don't have a thickness, like hmm. paint or wall coverings or other types of finishes? Or even just when your project is so small that you're not going to model those types of things. You're not modeling all of the finishes in every scenario. You're going to use Enscape, so you're going to model some finishes. Maybe you need to show some elevations. So you're going to show some you know, painted walls and tag them in elevation because they tag in elevation, right? Um, and they, you know, you'll be able to do whatever you need to there within elevations, but within plans, we're limited. So what do we do there? Like, how do we get all of this data back to our finished plans. Super, super frustrating for me because the, the, the room tag, which is not res- like actually corresponding to any of the finishes within the room is reporting the finishes, <laughs> right? And then I have accent walls. Like, how do I, mo- do I model those? Do I just put those in text? Paul, what do you do? Tell me. <laughs> I, I would love to hear an approach because I, I, uh, I see so, a thousand different approaches to this. Yeah, well, exactly right. There's not one right, correct approach. What I always try and tell my interiors clients is um, I, I want what they're, do- when they move to Revit, I, I want the net sum game to be better than what they were doing before. Right. So, but I don't necessarily want every feature or every task to be that way. So if, if, if some task is, or not that I want, of course I want them all to be better, but when they, like the finishes is probably the number one area where Revit is not much of an improvement for them. But I would argue that it's not really going backwards either. 
So even if they end up with dumb generic annotations to tag in a finish plan, that's no worse than blocks with attributes in AutoCAD. And then when you add all the other stuff that you can do in Revit that they're not getting now, like live schedules, like live interior elevations, like color fill plans, they fall out of their seats when I show them color fill plans, you know, then the net sum game is definitely an improvement. And I just have to shrug my shoulders and say, yeah, I'm with you on the finishes thing. There's not a great way to do it. There's a lot of okay, sucky ways to do it, but there's no one right way to do it. So if you're frustrated that you haven't found the one right way, it's because it doesn't exist. Uh, also, there's... do you know that wall wall sweeps don't report back to the material schedule? Uh, one one of them does. Uh, Instance-based or type-based? I forget which one. I think instance-based do, but- Neither. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that thought. Hold um, that thought for a couple of Regardless, months, essentially yeah. what, what we're starting to look at and what we've, we've started Easier. to think about is, is essentially populating a parameter of the room, or I'm yeah. sorry, of the wall, mm -hmm. a, a parameter of the wall with finished data. Mm -hmm. So we would essentially modify a, a wall tag mm -hmm. right. to tag the wall accent finishes. So you're not going to have to have 90 different types of finish walls that are, mm -hmm. you know, a 32nd or 64th or however thick you can actually get a finish wall with what a core layer being used. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're not going to have, please, this is another area 90 where... different types of architectural walls <laughs> <This> <laughs> in your another... model. I would fire you for my architectural firm if you did that. <laughs> this is another area where we might want to think back to, I think what Jeff said, I think it was Jeff that said it earlier, where maybe we need to challenge the way that we're, we've always done it. Like, mm. is it, um, is the way that finishes are being called out in the typical interiors firm, is that still the correct way to do it when ultimately the information, getting the information- Well, and that's what we always go back to, right? Yeah. Is the documents, the documents, how are we annotating it? How can we annotate it? How can yeah. we, how can we convey this to the contractor so that it can be built? Are we always exactly. gonna go back to an elevation? Is it a note? Is it, you know, it's not necessarily just a plan. Right, right? so what's the best way to do that exactly. now in the BIM paradigm? And, totally. and it may be that, some of that has to be rethought. I'm not letting Autodesk off the hook and saying, okay, well, <laughs> you know, they, they shouldn't try and improve this. But um, at the same time, we might be able to question that a little bit and come up with a way that conveys the information, does it mm -hmm. in a BIM paradigm where if you change it, it changes everywhere, which is ultimately what we want and communicates what we need communicated to the right parties. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, that's the goal, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I mean, I, I don't think it's letting Autodesk off the hook. Uh, so much as I mean, I, I do think we have to question and um, and the the particular graphic that we were looking at, you know, on the a minute ago before Dynamo is something that like a lot of interior designers bring to us to all of us, I'm sure, and ask how to do it. And you know, I don't think that's the right question for them to be asking. And yeah, there's a lot of very simple answers, and I do totally understand that we don't like a lot of the simple answers. Like super simple answer, we know we can auto elevate like every wall in the project. We mm -hmm. can do it really quickly. And then we know all the information is available there. Well, it's a waste of paper. Understood. Going back to Jeff's point, we don't have to print the drawings anymore. Who gives a damn if we have 2,000 extra interior elevations? I get that they want to see it in plan. For me, where the entire conversation breaks down is, look, the moment there's more than one finish on a wall, it's got to be elevated anyway. So if we're only talking about calling out a material finish and a material base for a uniform solid wall, there are a bunch of ways you can do it. And Dana, the approach of putting it in a parameter in the wall and then using a wall tag, that's awesome. You know, if it's that, if it's a generic annotation that is programmatically through Dynamo or the API reading the wall. Or just the manually input. It, right? Yeah, I mean, like, you know. At the end of the day, as long as it's like sure. deliberately tagged sure. and not just text. Sure. I mean, all I, mean, I could ask. Wouldn't you, you consider know. using, I don't know, I personally like to use material tags like this and do a material takeoff. Sure. 100 like percent i, yeah, I think the problem the problem where i find with actually modeling the finishes which i would 100 percent want to do if i were doing a rabbit model absolutely is the 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 walls or the i should say the finishes that don't have a thickness like mm -hmm. paint and wall covering <laughs> yeah, you can't have and you hopefully please don't create multiple different architectural walls with a yeah. finish layer of different types like that yeah no, I would I mean, go crazy. Like if you did that like, within I'll, my I'll, own model. I'll say something I'm not supposed to say, but I, I do use the the split <laughs> and the, the paint tool for some the of these. Split finishes. and paint tool. No, mm -hmm. I 
it's used. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. You can tag it in elevation. It's on the roadmap that you can tag it and plan. Mm -hmm. Eventually. I really hope that that happens. I would yeah, totally it, it, say it does that work you with model your though. tiles. If you have a thickness, sure, if you, you know, if you have something that's actually a modelable finish, then model it 100%. Mm -hmm. Nothing else because your bathroom has a clearance that you need to make, you know, <laughs> so, like you need to coordinate these things. Dana, I, I love that you just brought that up. Like, because that is the most paramount thing I think that could be said to interior designers. Um, and Jeff, you'll appreciate this in construction. We just had a project with a bathroom that was busted by 13 inches mm -hmm. because of what Dana's talking about. Mm. Ah, we didn't really need to worry about the thickness of the tile. Okay, well, tiles on two sides of a shower and there's nine showers in a row. <laughs> it 13 adds inches, up. redesign 13 it. 13 inches? Um, wow. not, not an exaggeration. It was actually 13 inches. And I, I will say that plumbing was put in that concrete before it was caught. It's usually yeah, how it works. I want to add to this. Um, I worked a lot with the interior designers at the two previous firms that I worked with. Um, everything, pretty much like everything, all this stuff that you said. Um, the only thing that I found sort of like helpful with the specific teams that I was working with was that to get them to understand that Revit's, Revit is designed to work slightly differently. You define types, 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 and you document that type once and you just mark that type everywhere in your drawings stay away from tagging everything everywhere and all that kind of stuff. So we created, uh, we created, I got them comfortable with having hundreds of different wall types in their projects, floor types, ceilings, all that kind of stuff. And then come, came up with a naming convention that the, everybody was were comfortable with so that they know uh, sort of like, this is the wall that has a tile of that thickness, has a base of that thickness yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So one of the things that actually help is to train him how to be able to create more complex types and be able to work with them. And they ended up creating um, uh, wall sheets with elevations of the typical walls that they have. It might be like two sheets of just walls and, uh, you know, this, this kind of stuff. So in that element. scenario, I would say just model it as a separate wall, right? But what, but once again, it's the, <laughs> it's the ones where you have like a, a literally no thickness. Yeah. And or um, because of your ha modeling it as a separate wall. So maybe this is the argument for Hassan's approach of you now have two separate walls. So if you have an opening, you have to join the two walls. Mm -hmm. If you have any face based elements like electrical devices or fire hydrants, anything that is hosted to the face of that wall. Now it has to be hosted to the finished wall. So does that wall get shown everywhere? What if it accidentally gets mm -hmm. dimensioned to, you know, you have all of these additional questions in terms of how this things get thing gets shown up. And you don't have to document, so, document them in the floor plans. You do it one in elevation, show the elevation of the wall, the materials that you have with the material tags, and you're done. Everywhere else, yeah, you just yeah. tag that wall. Well, so, and a so lot back... of these things are, are you know, solvable through, through joint geometry, through other things, but still, it, it leads to these implications of, okay, so now you model the wall, then you join the geometry, then you, you align the two to make sure that they all, you know, or like, whatever it might be. Then you make sure that, that all of the engineers know to host all of their elements to this space rather than that space. And it just mm -hmm. creates this whole list of implications within the whole process. So, so Dana, the, the zero thickness finishes that you brought up are a monumental issue, like the wallpaper and the paint specifically, because I'll tell you guys a quick story, but in 2013, I was frustrated with this issue as well. And I thought I'm going to try an experiment if it works awesome. And if not, I'll have to abandon it. I actually made the mistake of trying to model them on a project because I figured, look, we do it for tile walls. We do it for brick walls. We do it for wood walls and it works. So I made really thin wall types and called them paint and wallpaper. And <laughs> what a freaking disaster that was. <laughs> uh, I mean, anything anything basically at or thinner than 16th of an inch and even in hidden line mode and elevation, Revit will let you see through it when you're zooming around and when you're printing and everything in the drawings is just ruined at that point. So yeah, it's a real issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this is this is exactly the conversation that I had with the interior design team. Like that's what they were asking for. And that's why you create types. Rather yeah, than that's why you create types. Right. Revit is designed to be able to work with types. You're or not parts. supposed to create I a saw bunch parts of thrown into together. the chat. <laughs> Please. It was just as bad as types. Talk about can of worms parts. I I said I said to Jacob in the call, I said that is adding a Slow can down. of worms Slow to down. my can of worms. We now have two cans of worms. <laughs> <laughs> 
hearts is so Dana, oh when, uh, when Bill sees to... this uh, recording later, he's going to say we're at four Aubins. Yeah, we yeah, we're going to talk about parts. I'm going to have to go get a six pack. No, okay, yeah, yeah, no, no. I, I think not added I think, BIM yeah. thoughts listeners and Aubin is 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, no, Paul I think Aubin listens to BIM thoughts and he says he will only listen to 30 yeah. minutes. He That's not exactly what I said. Times but... two. So <laughs> yeah, but I do play it at double speed. Yeah. Um, no, that's not exactly what I said. When Bim Thoughts was first getting started, I said, oh, it's a great it's a great podcast, but it's too long. I said, you, you're going to lose people after 30 minutes. And then he started calling that an Aubin. <laughs> no, I, I think. Called somebody else long-winded. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Ouch. Oh, man, it's it's Bash and Paul night. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> yeah. Hey, guilty. Guilty. I mean, I. Uh... Oh, I am too. I am too. I mean, I'm I'm on that horse, so. Yeah. Awesome. No, I think that's, I think it's a good point to wrap up. This is awesome. This is almost two hours. Is fantastic i think to, to wrap up the interior piece to, to sort of put a bow on it from my opinion which is again i'll think from the downstream use i think all of us on this call would agree that a model centric future is the way we should be all thinking and however we can help the industry get that way is always better and so i will tell you that any of the solutions as long as there's a model or an element that has the data in it can be used downstream right so whether it's a thin line whether it's a wall that has a instance parameter whether it's a million types as long as you can click that and you know by clicking that wall what what color it is what type as long as somewhere you can find that out that's really the end goal right so so the one thing i will scrap is the generic annotation pointing on a floor plan because that doesn't assign to an element right i mean that's that's just an annotation that, but that, so, it's be that does well, why they don't uh, so, use Revit, then I'm going to let them use the generic <laughs> annotation. Go for so, it. You know? So, Jeff, I want I want to just throw one clarification on that. You know, if if the model has been painted, you know, well, whether, yes, you're, yes. Using, whether, I, whether yeah. you're using whether you're using split face or split object, and then you have used the actual paint tool on it. I was talking about generic annotations because then through the API, you can programmatically tell the GA what's on the wall. Yes. Yes. But more often than not, I just see hey, a generic from annotation. Parallax team with... just said import CAD. <laughs> yeah. Exploded. Oh, get them off the chat. <laughs> oh, definitely man. import CAD, definitely explode it, and then call us when you need us to unscrew <laughs> that project. Yeah. And leave all of the line Please work, leave all of the text, it. don't or clean anything up. <laughs> yeah. Best oh, user in the world, self taught, no lessons. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, my God. Awesome. <laughs> Well, this has been this has been really cool. I have to say, I didn't think we were gonna go for two hours, and and we could probably keep going all night if we wanted to. So, thank you guys, uh, all seven of you, six of you, seven plus me. So, uh, all hey, six of you fun, for joining. Jeff, thanks. Jeff, congratulations uh, on your fiftieth episode. Hey. I would drink, but I finished my wine. You know, so. <laughs> I finished my bottle. No, you didn't. Oh I swear to God, dude. And I'm still so coherent. Oh, However, man. I will That's fantastic. say that I I could. I, if only I didn't have work tomorrow. I could use my corkscrewish <laughs> thing again. For anyone who missed it, because you weren't here yet on the call, that's how that's how Dana opened her bottle of brute was with a, uh, a nutcracker. <laughs> yeah, it's way stronger than I am. I can grip. Oh man! All right, you guys are amazing. You guys live here on the chat. Thank you for chatting up a storm. I cannot believe that I was extremely active. So awesome! Thank you guys Two for hours, joining me. One bottle. Yeah, I, and yeah, yeah. You, you could have done two. You could have done two. <laughs> oh man! All right, Asan, Philip, Paul, Nick, Dana, Aaron, you guys. Thank you so much for joining me. I will put all the links, as many as I can possibly grab from what we mentioned, as well as links to find all of you guys in the description, as well as in the blog post tomorrowish. Maybe tomorrow, it depend. I'm on vacation, so we'll see how I feel like doing it tomorrow. <laughs> Maybe it'll be a little later. <laughs> My vacation has is, is been building a deck and doing all kinds of hard yard work. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, I but I haven't been on the computer. room over Christmas break. Yeah, so yeah. I feel, that's, yeah. that's where I am in my life. My vacations are housework, but it's okay. It, I'm cool with it. <laughs> all right, everyone. Thank you right, so much. Thanks, Jeff. You guys are amazing. Thanks for having us. Good night. Everyone have a great weekend. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.